You call to order, Catalina, when you're uh, ready. Yes, Your Worship, right at 7 p.m. It's 6.59. <clears throat> Got it. Call to order, please. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We will begin this council meeting by acknowledging that the County of Prince Edward is on traditional land that has been inhabited by indigenous peoples from the beginning. We thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this land. Today, the County of Prince Edward is still home to many First Nations and Métis people, and we are grateful to have an opportunity to meet here, work, and continue stewardship of this land. On behalf of our staff and members of council, I'd like to welcome all the um, guests joining us electronically um, for this meeting of council. We're still relatively new to electronic meetings, so please bear with us um, as we go through a rather fulsome agenda this evening. Tonight's agenda lists all the items before council for consideration. The recommended motions on tonight's agenda are shown in boldface. Copies of the agenda have been posted on our website. This meeting is being live streamed and any participation in the meeting proceedings will become part of the public record. Recording from the meeting will be published on the county's website immediately and can be viewed by selecting the streaming tab 
on the county's homepage at thecounty.ca. We also have, we have one deputation under agenda item seven. I remind the uh, deputant that when you speak, please state your full name and address your comments to the chair. Following the deputation, there may be questions from members of council. Under agenda item eight, um, we do not have any comments from the audience this evening. However, members of the public who wish to provide comments at future meetings can do so by contacting clerks at pecounty.on.ca to register. The maximum time allotted for comments is 30 minutes. And your name will be included in the council minutes and form part of the public record posted to the county's website. At item nine on the agenda, council will move into planning public council to consider staff reports with respect to the planning applications as listed on the agenda to receive any deputations and submissions related to those planning applications and to make recommendations on each application under the provisions of the Planning Act. Bylaws listed on this agenda provide the full force of law to decisions of council. Any matter decided today, by either resolution or bylaw is final and cannot be revisited by council until four regular meetings have expired without a two third majority vote. As matters of housekeeping, if I can please turn off or mute all cell phones. Um, and just for the information of members of council and those uh, watching at home, I'll be calling a um, recesses at the two hour mark um, to give us a bit of a break, uh, break for a few minutes, just so everybody's aware. Um, that will move us to item number three, the confirmation of the agenda. And I have Councillor Hirsch moving this. Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a Hirsch-Bailey motion that the agenda for the council meeting of May 12, 2020 be confirmed. Thank you. All those in favor, just raise your hand. And that carries, moves us to item four, disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Does anybody have anything to declare concerning any of the items on the agenda? No, okay. Item five is announcements. Does anybody have anything they wish to uh, bring forward to announce? No, okay. Um, I've got a couple of things I'd like to bring forward. First of all, I think everybody got the, the email today about the resignation of uh, Paul Walsh, who is um, moving on to another municipality. I just want to take the opportunity to thank him for his um, time and commitment to the municipality over the past few years and to wish him all the, uh, the best as he moves on in his career. Uh, the second thing is that uh, and you may have seen this as part of Premier Ford's announcement uh, yesterday, but this is National Nursing Week in Canada. And today, May 12th, 2020, is the two, 200th birthday of Florence Nightingale. So in that spirit, I want to take a moment to recognize the nurses in our community uh, working so hard to keep us safe and protected as we go through uh, these very uncertain times with uh, coronavirus and COVID-19. Uh, next item is item six, adoption of minutes. And this is Councillor Margotson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a Margotson Harbor motion that the council minutes from the electronic meeting held on April 15th, 2020 be adopted as presented. Okay, thank you. Any uh, any questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? And that carries. 6.2, I believe this is a McMahon for uh, Forrester motion. Am I correct, Madam Clerk? Correct. Yeah. Yes, correct. Uh, correct. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a McMahon Forster motion that the council minutes from the electronic special meeting held on April 30th, 2020 be adopted as presented. Any comments or questions concerning that? No. All those in favor? 
Just raise your hands, please. Thank you. That carries. Moves us to 6.3. A uh, Councillor Maynard, this is yours. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Maynard Bolick motion that the council minutes from the electronic special meeting held on May 7th, 2020 be adopted as presented. Thank you. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? And that carries. Thank you. Moves us to deputations. We have uh, one. This is Jamie Chisholm. Um, Madam Clerk, if you could bring um, Jamie into the under this into the meeting. Hi, Jamie. He's not connected yet. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Jamie? I can now. I just had okay, to press great. the right button. I apologize, everybody. That's okay. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and if uh, you could make your remarks and remind you, you've got 10 minutes, but you've been here before, so you know the drill. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Mayor and members of council. My name is Jamie Chisholm. Uh, I am a principal in a company known as Picton Properties Incorporated. We are the owners of 13300 Loyalist Parkway, the former hydro site. Uh, if you've been by lately, um, it doesn't look much like the former hydro site anymore. So hopefully that is a, a good thing. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to council tonight. Um, and certainly uh, I'm not sure if you've had an opportunity to review the staff report. So I don't necessarily need to go through uh, my entire presentation that I'd submitted, but I would say that, uh, you know, certainly uh, this development, even in, in advance of the current challenges that we're all uh, facing right now uh, was was challenging uh, from an economic perspective. The cost of developing bricks and mortar these days uh, with significant land costs, carrying costs, um, and just the, the process is uh, cumbersome to say the least. Uh, the current pandemic certainly has impacted uh, a significant portion of what we thought would be our beyond phase one, uh, in particular, any thought that we had of finalizing agreements with restaurants have uh, uh, pretty much evaporated in the past three months. And it, it's not a Picton uh, specific item. I, I wanna point that out is that I think any uh, restaurant uh, group uh, until things are somewhat normalized in any community uh, would be very hesitant to commit to any kind of bricks and mortar, but certainly uh, that is the case here as well. Uh, our hope and expectation for this development uh, that we started working on uh, over four years ago was that it would be open by now. Uh, the process uh, and the, the timing for this development uh, was not controlled by us. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, if, if we had the choice, we would have tried to find a way to bypass the uh, MTO EA approvals process. Uh, and some other elements of this, but uh, we had no control over that. Uh, our, our request today is, is not uh, only economic, but it's, uh, it's in fairness and in our view in keeping with what our expectations had been, not only since 2016, but as recently as last year when we uh, were before council for site plan approval. Um, our familiarity with what the development charge expectation was, for example, was, you know, throughout those four years, councils, successive councils had consistently approved um, setting development charges at a rate to encourage uh, economic development, in particular commercial development in the community. And uh, ironically, uh, notwithstanding the fact that that was renewed for four years, now that we're at the stage to actually commence that uh, reduction has expired. So when, when, having said that, when we were before council and got approval uh, in September, that was in place. Um, in terms of uh, other items, I mean, we have 
uh, this site was a, a functioning site, hydro site. It has and had uh, an existing water service to service the uh, five buildings that were on site. Um, and we've been paying for that water service uh, since we've owned the site in 2018. Uh, so if this development proceeds, uh, I mean, it'll bring a lot of things to the community. Uh, it will certainly create uh, significant new jobs. And even in advance of the pandemic, I think that was a, a pretty important and consistent objective uh, in the county. Um, another important aspect of commercial development is it is it's a net contributor. Uh, unlike residential development, you know, we don't need garbage pickup. We do our own garbage pickup. Uh, we don't need schools. We don't need many municipal services that a, a new residential subdivision would uh, require. Um, I think what's especially true today is that uh, this shopping center, this uh, food store and other retailers, just its configuration compared to the current location of the food land or Sobeys rather, uh, will create a significantly better and safer shopping experience. Uh, if anybody's been to Jamie's, uh, Jamie EO's store, uh, currently, uh, I'm sure you all realize that uh, the ability for both staff or customers to social distance in that environment is uh, challenging to say the least. Um, in terms of what this development will do, just in context financially, um, the, the current Picton Plaza uh, downtown is about 30, 39,000 square feet. This first phase, first building will be about 46,000 square feet. We don't know for certain what impact will do with our assessment, but just kind of extrapolating what Picton Plaza is currently paying. Um, they're about 39,000 square feet and they pay in round numbers, $110,000 a year in taxes. Uh, based on what uh, we think assessment will be uh, for this shopping center, we expect that our assessment just for this first phase alone will provide a, a tax uh, payout to the municipality of approximately 150,000. That's uh, as a comparison, uh, 2019's taxes for uh, this site as, as it is now was $10,169. So this would be in round numbers, 15 times uh, the assessment that's currently being generated from the site. So in, in terms of pure numbers, uh, as I mentioned before, for the last four years, there was a, for commercial development, there's a 50% reduction. Um, and if you look at the deck that I provided, I, I cut and paste, perhaps not as pretty as I should have, it reinforces my uh, IT and uh, graphic skills. But again, as, as we went into council approval for site plan last year, uh, the fees in place were for $1.77 a square foot for commercial development. Um, and so what, what are we asking for? We're asking that uh, that remain in place for our first phase. Uh, we certainly uh, would have liked that to apply to the entire development, but in a very constructive consulta consultation with staff over the last number of months, um, it was uh, agreed that uh, this, uh, this rate would apply to uh, the building one or phase one only. And that is the, uh, the food land uh, building at the back of the site. Uh, the water connection fees, uh, we've, uh, uh, when we say we've asked that they be waived, I mean, it, it, in our view, my view, it shouldn't even have been a question. If you have an existing water service and you're paying for it and you're reusing it again, uh, why would you have to pay or why should you have to pay for a separate water connection fee? On top of that, as you may recall, if you look at the site plan agreement that we have with the county, uh, as a part of our, uh, off-site contribution uh, in the site plan agreement, uh, we uh, contributed uh, in total uh, 147,000 for extension of services in Street A, both sewer and water. Uh, 88 of that, 88,000 of that is allocated to the first phase. Uh, so my uh, two things, so we have an existing water service, we've contributed on top of that another $88,000 for the extension of that services. So. The, the notion that we should have to pay a connection for uh, water services that A, we already have and that we've paid 100% of the new in, cost of the new infrastructure, it's, it seems like double dipping uh, if, if it isn't granted. Um, so 
I guess in conclusion, with the keeping of the uh, previously approved uh, rate for development charges and the uh, acknowledgement that we have an existing water service, it's important to note that even with these uh, acknowledgements, we will still be paying over $300,000 in connection fees and development charges for essentially two businesses. Um, and that's a pretty significant money, a significant amount of money. Uh, certainly, uh, again, I'll reinforce the, the amount of assessment uh, on an ongoing basis uh, that this development will pay is in addition to that. I've already mentioned that in addition to the 302,000 in connection development charges, uh, we, we have agreed for this phase alone, agreed to pay another $88,000. Uh, other upfront fees we'll have aside from the actual construction of this phase, which I indicated in my notes, we'll be spending in excess of $10 million. In order to proceed, we have to give the municipality another $240,000 on top of all the fees I just mentioned uh, for securities. Uh, so any, any sense that, you know, we're, we're not paying our fair share, I think is, uh, uh, inaccurate and, and we certainly are, um, at the end of the day, this, this project, um, uh, as I mentioned before is one that even our lenders have put tighter restrictions on us in light of this current pandemic. And so we're every, every cent, uh, counts here. Um, if. I knew today uh, what I, or if, if I knew four years ago what I know today, I'm not sure we would have penciled out if, if we thought we could only do these two developments, but we're uh, at this point, we're, we're $2 million committed to this project. Uh, we really have no choice uh, to, to find a way to make this happen. It, it's by no means a financial windfall, perhaps in five years or 10 years when we, if and when we develop the rest of the property be worthwhile, but we desperately, desperately uh, need these uh, credits uh, that were in place when we got site plan approval. Uh, that is the essence of what I have to say and I'm happy to answer any questions or provide clarification on anything I've said. Thank you. Open the floor to questions. Anybody have any questions for Jamie? Please raise your hand. Uh, Councillor Maynard. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, to you, Jamie, thanks for your deputation. And uh, just so when you first initiated your, when you started your process through the, uh, through the, the planning department, the, uh, the reduced DCs were in place at that time? Yes. Yes. And you, you were aware though that that, uh, that was always a temporary measure and was reviewed annually by council and uh, could be repealed at uh, any time. And also that uh, any reductions that are made up to the DCs were, um, had, to be, um, had to be refunded through uh, the ratepayers. I not sure I understood the second part, but in terms okay. of the in inevitability. That it was temporary in nature and that uh, it could have been repealed at any time. Uh, well, I, I guess that's that's true of any uh, bylaw can can be changed by municipality at any time. But I, I certainly, uh, I think that uh, if the, the basis of the uh, incentive was there to encourage commercial development and to the best of my knowledge, uh, this may be the first uh, commercial development over that span of period, it seems ironic that the time that it's now ready to go, that the decision is to eliminate the, the very incentive that you put in place to encourage companies like mine to invest. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Jamie, if I can ask just for clarification of one thing early on in your deputation, you stated if the development proceeds, that was that, you know, an error of language, or is there a question about that? Uh, was I, as I finished, I think we're, as I said, we're committed to go. But I, we're as over the last three weeks, we've been working with uh, a new equity investor to help facilitate um, 
this through. So it, I, if I were a betting person, I would say we're proceeding, but uh, all the T's and all the I's are, are not crossed and all the I's are not dotted, coupled with the fact that uh, technically as we speak, we're still, as is the county uh, with respect to uh, the new road, waiting for final sign off from the MTO uh, uh, for the building and land use permit. There's no reasonable reason to believe that we we and the county won't get our approvals from the MTO, but you know, technically speaking, uh, I can't look at anybody in the eye and guarantee we can proceed until we have all those approvals in place. Yeah, okay. I, mm -hmm. I got the context. Okay, thank you very much. So this is a uh, Councillor Harper motion to receive the deputation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, it's a Harper Prinzen motion that the deputation by Jamie Chisholm regarding Picton Properties, a review of development costs, including development charges and service connection fees, be received. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? That carries. <clears throat> As uh, noted in the preamble, there are no comments from members of the audience. So we are going to move on to um, item number nine items for consideration planning. And if um, this is a Councillor Nyman motion to um, move into planning public council. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a Nyman St. Jean motion that council now move into, the, into planning public council to consider staff reports with respect to the planning applications as listed on this agenda. Receive deputations and submissions related to those planning applications and make recommendations on each application under the provisions of the Planning Act. Thank you. All those in favor? And that carries. So we'll move into uh, Planning Public Council. And this meeting is public meeting as required under the Planning Act and we'll deal with the planning applications listed on this evening's agenda. If you wish to be notified of the decision of the County of Prince Edward on the proposed official plan amendment, you must make a written, recommend, written request at least to the clerk of the County of Prince Edward or make an electronic comment on the application. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal a decision of the County of Prince Edward to the local Planning Appeal Tribunal or, or LPAT, but the person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the County of Prince Edward before the proposed amendment is adopted, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision to the local Planning Appeal Tribunal. So we've got um, five items before us. Um, and then we'll move on to item nine points to the consent application. Um, this involves Sonia uh, Bartman, 1475 County Road 19 in the ward of Ameliasburg. Do staff any, have any additional comments to include uh, with the staff report? Uh, nothing further, uh, Mayor. Uh, thank you. I'll ask if the, is the applicant or the uh, agent for the application present and are they in agreement uh, with the conditions of approval as outlined in the in the uh, report do we have anybody present i'm here sorry department is ray as uh, uh, is, is ray here madam clerk do your worship ray is now joining okay so i'll, I'll ask the question the question again, Ray, uh, the, condition, the applicant or agent is present and are they in agreement with the conditions of approval as outlined in the report? Yes, it's Ray S. E. Amber here, I'm representing the applicant. And uh, I have gone through the uh, conditions with uh, the applicant, Sonia Bartman, and she's in agreement with the, uh, the conditions as recommended by staff. Okay, thank you. And is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak to uh, this application? 
Through your worship, uh, no members of the public registered to speak on this application. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions of members of council about this application? Nobody, okay, so I'll call the vote. All those in favor? If I could see your hands, please. Okay, that, that carries. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Moves us to item 9.3, consent and rezoning application, file number B19-2020, said 13-2020. This is Helen Tomlinson, 8 Shenandoah Road, ward of uh, Sophiasburg. Are there any um, any additional comments from staff members? Uh, through the chair, this application? No, not. I'm sorry? Uh, through the chair, no, we do not. You do not, okay. Uh, is the applicant or the applicant's agent present and are they in agreement with the conditions of approval as outlined in the report? Is anybody here representing the applicant? That'd be Mark Tomlinson. Oh yeah, I'm here. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, I was following the video or the uh, meeting on YouTube. Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm here. What was the question? Sorry. Are, are you in agreement with the conditions of approval as outlined in the report? Yes, I am. Yes. You are okay. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to speak to the subject application? No, seeing no one, okay, then I will uh, call the vote on this. Or any questions from members of um, council? Okay, then I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Raise your hands, please. And that carries. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Two, nine point four. 9.4, another consent and rezoning application, Drew Harrison and Christine Harrison. Um, so I'll ask staff if there are any additional comments to include with this staff report. Uh, through the chair, no, there's not. There aren't, okay. Is the applicant or the applicant's agent present? And are they in agreement with the conditions of approval as outlined in the report? It's Bill. Can you hear me? It's Bill Rarbeck. Yeah. I'm the representative of are the uh, agent for the applicant and we're in total agreement. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak to the subject application? No. Okay, any questions of members of council? Seeing none, and I have made a, an error here. This not gone through the motion process. So we'll get back on track. Councillor Prinzen's motion, seconded by Councillor Forrester. If you could go through this, Councillor Prinzen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a Prinzen Forrester motion that report DS-25 slash 2020 of development services dated May 12, 2020 regarding consent file numbers B14-20, B15-20, and zoning bylaw amendment file number Z9-20 be received. That consent file number B14-20 and B15-20, Drew and Christine Harrison, for lands located in his part lot 54 and 55, Consecon Bayside, as in PE76640, in Ward 8, North Marysburg, be approved, subject to the following conditions. One through... 12, and that zoning application file number Z9-20, Drew and Christine Harrison for lands located in his part lot 54 and 55, concession bayside as in PE 76640 in Ward 8, North Marysburg be approved. Thank you, all those in favor? Thank you, that carries and moves us to item 9.5, consent Thank you. Re rezoning application um, 
files number B1120, 1220, 1320, and Z8-20. Uh, I'll ask staff if there are any additional comments to include with this staff report. Any, any additional comments? Sorry, I think it was patched in a little bit later. Good evening, everyone. Um, are we on the Hill Street application? I was following on YouTube. Uh, we are on item 9.5, the Hill yeah. Street application. And I just asked if staff have any additional comments to include with the report. Yeah, so I, I thought that um, through the chair, I, I would just give a, a quick summary. It, it's a bit of a complicated uh, site. And yeah. so I thought it'd be beneficial to just run through some of the highlights of, of the application. Okay. Um, I think for simplicity, if everybody could refer to attachment three of my plan report, I believe it's on page 101 of the agenda. It provides um, uh, a concept plan and the, the draft layout of what the uh, proposed buildings would look like on the site. And so if you refer to that, you'll see that there are three new residential lots being proposed. Um, these three residential lots are fronting onto Main Street. And then we have a retained portion, which is fronting, sorry, the three lots are fronting onto Hill Street. The retained portion is fronting onto Main Street. Um, staff have reviewed this application and considered uh, requirements of the Planning Act and the Provincial Policy Statement. We've also delved into the secondary plan which permits the creation of, of three lots plus a retained portion, so no more than four, um, without a plan of subdivision. So this is the maximum number of uh, lots that can be created by consent, but it is permitted in the secondary plan. Um, we've reviewed the development policies of the town corridor designation and also the town residential designation. In addition, staff have uh, reviewed the urban design guidelines, which is in section 4.1 of the secondary plan. And we determined that the proposed uses are appropriate for the neighborhood. Um, the proposed uses are compatible with the adjacent uh, uses, um, adjacent properties, adjacent residential uses. And the design of the uh, proposed houses are in, in keeping with what you would typically find along, along Hill Street and along Fairfield. Um, the zoning of the site will implement the, the buildings that are proposed. In regard to the retained portion, um, we've, we've created a bylaw which reflects the prior use of the property. And we, we acknowledge that there was a building there at one time and it's been, it was removed approximately 10 years ago. And, um, and so the bylaw that, that, is, that is before you would implement uh, the reconstruction of that building on its former uh, site. Um, standard conditions that we've included in the report um, are typical with the exception of uh, conditions seven and eight. And these conditions um, are in regards to some servicing issues that we anticipate on, on Hill Street. There, uh, there's new water connections that would need to be brought in from the street and, um, and some regrading and sidewalk repair that would, that would occur as a result of the construction. So those are the conditions and, um, and a, a brief summary of where we are. So if there's any questions, uh, please, please feel free to ask. Okay. Um. Before I uh, ask, um, I guess, Madam Clerk, it's appropriate for council questions or will we go for comments from the audience? Well, hang on for a minute. Let me, let me go through this, the, uh, the appropriate process and then we'll open the floor to questions. Is the applicant or the applicant's agent present? Uh, through, through the chair, no, I, I spoke with the applicant this afternoon. He was not planning on attending tonight. Okay. Um, so I'll ask if there's anyone in the audience who wishes to speak to this subject application. I believe we have one person, Colleen, and, and forgive me if I pronounce your, mispronounce your name, um, Zignac. Close enough. <laughs> well, what, oh, how do you pronounce it? What, what's, we say Janak. Janak, okay. 
Hello, okay. Ferguson and counselors. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just a reminder, you've got 10 minutes. Okay. So we are the property owners of 358 Main Street, and we share a shared driveway with the property in question for the rezoning tonight, parts lot 70, 71, 72, and 75. We are specifically objecting the rezoning from the urban residential type R1 zone to the special urban residential R160 zone fronting the Main Street property in question. We sent all the council members, including the mayor, the clerk, and the planner, our list of objections, including correspondence that we've had from Dave Cleave. We hope you've read all of this um, as these few minutes we get tonight to contest the zoning is near not enough time to state why we are appealing it. We were very disheartened when only Councillor Nyman reached out to us after sending the emails with our objections, um, but I hope everybody has read it in the meantime. Mm -hmm. First of all, we want an environmental study done on the, the properties in question. There was unsafe removal of the asbestos done during the demolition of the old Picton Manor building. We, as well as neighbors around us, have lodged phone complaints to Shire Hall during this time that the removal was being done. Nobody returned our calls. The removal was done without proper safety equipment that we saw, and it was done during the evenings and the weekend, which started and stopped very quickly. We are concerned. The building was then left sitting half torn down for months and months. We are scared for what is in the ground and seeping into our yards and our neighbor's yards. We feel that there is contamination. On page 96 of this agenda, it states that a MOE assessment was done. When was it done? Is there copies to view? And was it done on all parts of the lot in question? Um, most directly impacting our lives and our home is a proposed house that Dave Cleave wants to put up on the lot, sharing our driveway fronting Main Street. This was on pages 104 to 109 in the agenda. We share a driveway. We moved into this home in 2005 and there was a house beside us that was falling down, which was owned by Picton Manor. It was torn down while we were away for a week of holidays in 2009 and we weren't told that this happening. Our, friend, our foundation at the time was compromised and damaged as well as the driveway, again, which is shared with that property. There is only 14 feet between our home and the proposed land where Dave Cleave plans to build this new home, which is all driveway space, shared driveway space. Why is this property to have a smaller frontage of 2.6 meters when the house will have to basically sit on the sidewalk as that lot size is extremely irregular and basically shared with our lot to make a full rectangular? How can it be constructed in the location of the former dwelling with a smaller frontage, especially when this dwelling has been gone since 2009. We are confused. How can a new build be built so close to the sidewalk, the road, our home and the neighbor's home? This lot is too small for a house to be built and to have the proper Prince Edward County parking bylaw, which I believe is under section 5.1.1 in the parking bylaws, for single home dwellings to have space for two cars to park along with our cars to park and to manage to safely share a driveway. There will not be room. Has anybody physically been to this property to assess it before putting it through these requests to see how it will physically work? Or was it all done by site with papers and aerial views? Cars will not fit, a new house will not fit. It's just not feasible on the lot with parking to share a driveway under the current bylaws and to get in and out as well as get our small travel trailer in that we've had for 10 years in our yard. Will we have to sell our house due to this new build? Why are our lives being ruined for this quick new build that was lied to us about and not brought to our attention until we asked about it? Why is it being slid through in a zoning request and a new build request all at once? We stated four pages of concerns that we don't have time to share tonight. It was all sent to you via email, which I've already mentioned. Dave Cleave and I have had some conversation and correspondence um, over the past several months since the fall, and we've also met. He stated on March the 3rd of this year that he would maintain the property as it is, as it was a low priority for him. In fact, he basically lied knowing he was planning to build a new home without telling us, perhaps in hopes that I wouldn't ask for plans or that we wouldn't care about this meeting tonight. And nowhere did it show on the paperwork that we got about this meeting tonight that a new house was gonna be put up in place. 
We only discovered it when I emailed Dave Cleave since we hadn't chatted about it. Originally, he wanted um, to do some severing of our yard with the 360 property and take the back end of our yard to make four houses fronting Hill Street and Fairfield Street. Um, then we didn't hear anything after that. He knew that we wanted to buy the property at 360 Main Street for some time now. Um, he knew we didn't want a house going up there. He knew we were concerned. The space is tiny. He knew that. Um, we're just very disheartened in the whole fact that what we were told and what is happening is false. Um, he told us he didn't want to compromise our property value, but again, that's happening. Uh, we've had some talks with Matt Coffey along the way as well. We're concerned we had structural damage to our house when the house was tore down in 2009 next door. A new build, digging, heavy machinery, whatnot going in next door is gonna compromise our house again. The driveway which is shared is caving in due to the deconstruction of that house in 2009. Has that been looked at? It's a huge concern. And how will this have impact on our lives when a building is going up next door with our parking access into our home? There's just not space for machinery to be out there building a new home unless they're gonna completely block the shared driveway. We will not be able to get in. The lot is way too tiny. Is there an easement agreement? What's the current survey? What's the shared driveman allotment? Um, and also on a side note, we question the wording on page 89 of the agenda where it states about the consent file B13 to 20 and it lists County Road 3. We're not County Road 3. I'm not sure if that was a typo, but I'm not too sure about that. I just wanted to bring that up as well tonight. All in all, we just simply object to this rezoning. Our home and our lives as we know it since 2005 will be ruined over a quickly put up house crunched in between our house and our neighbor's house, sharing a driveway with our property, all for Dave Cleave to make a fast buck and not really think about us. We've maintained the driveway, the snow removal, the yard cleaning, the yard um, grass cutting since we moved in in 2005 with no credit from anybody, old owners or new owners. We, we just don't want this to devastate our lives. We are essential shift workers. Uh, we just don't want this to ruin our lives. Are we gonna have to sell our house and move out of Prince Edward County for this quick put up house? Um, anyways, thank you for your time and letting us voice our opinions on this. And again, we object to the zoning going through for this property, but most importantly, the property facing the main street. Um, should the environmental review go past on the Hill Street properties, we agree to those buildings, the three new buildings going up in place of Picton Manor but not next door on the 360 Main Street property. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Colleen. Um, are there questions from members of um, council concerning this? Councillor Margotson, and then I've got Councillor Nyman. Yes, thank you. Um, question through to, the, to Colleen. Colleen, the shared driveway you refer to, Yes. Is that uh, a right of way over the adjacent land in your favor? It's or a right of way. It... Oh, sorry, go ahead. The proper so, line goes right down the center of the driveway. It goes down the center of the driveway. So the right of way abuts the, your, your um, parcel all the way along the, the side of the driveway. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you can enter your land from anywhere along that right of way. I was just looking at the sketch on page 99 and I didn't understand that hatched part of that it showed a uh, hatched line. So I was just seeking clarification. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Nyman. Uh, sorry, I, I'll wait and ask my questions to staff. Okay. Any other questions of uh, Colleen? I think that's all for now. We're just, we just don't want to, we just subject. All right. Um, so, Madam Clerk, we're putting this on the floor and then questions of staff. Is that what we're doing? Correct, Your Worship, putting it on the floor and then opening it up for questions of staff. Okay. So, this is uh, uh, Councillor McNaughton. 
if you would do the honors Thank on you. this. Sorry, I just have to go back to another device because that's how this rolls. Um, oh, and it's not loading. Is the seconder John Hirsch? Who's the seconder? Sorry about that's that. Hirsch. Thank yes. you. So this is the McNaughton Hirsch uh, motion that report DS. 31 2020 of development services dated March 18th, 2020 regarding consent file numbers B11 20, B12 20, B13 20, and zoning bylaw amendment file number Z8 20 be received. That consent file number B11 20, B12 20, B13 20. Uh, 103684.23 Canada Inc. for lands described as part lots 70, 71, 72, and 75, plan 24 in the ward if picked in, be approved subject to the following conditions, conditions one through, I believe, 13. Um, and that zoning application file number Z8-20103684.23 Canada Inc. for lands described as part lots 70, 71, 72, and 75, plan 24 in the ward of Picton be finally approved. Thank you. So questions of um, staff. Uh, Councillor Nyman, I think, has hand up first. Then Councillor Margetson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a couple questions. Um, I, I, reading the report, I don't see much, uh, but there was much dialogue with the, the neighbors. Uh, was there any dialogue that we know of with the neighbors? Are you asking this if? To my call or oh, Matt, okay. I guess, whoever will answer. Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, so through the chair, um, we did finally connect with, um, with Colleen uh, probably two weeks ago. It was sometime after the uh, staff report was drafted. Um, we did finally connect through email. Okay. And, and we did have, have a, a oh. sorry. Okay. Oh. Can I have a follow up? Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, I've read some of the stuff that we've got and I've listened to some of the neighbors and they really, some of the concerns that they have hasn't been addressed in this report. And so how does that, how do their concerns get addressed if this gets passed without a site plan agreement? Matt? Uh, through the chair. So um, in addition to Colleen, we also had an, another neighbor, which um, I spoke to this afternoon. And um, I'm not sure if, if those concerns can be addressed uh, through a site plan or not. Uh, it's a small development. We typically don't ask for site plan agreements or consent applications. Um, th there is a there is a development agreement requirement for this um, for this site, and it's mainly to do with the engineering on Hill Street. But but if there are items that that we need to add to that, we could we could potentially go through that process and add it to the development agreement, which we've already asked for. Just another quick follow up if I could. So I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what I'm hearing is there really hasn't been much conversation with the surrounding neighbors. And we're not sure how to address that because we don't know what the concerns are. Neither does Mr. Cleve, or he might have addressed it during this whole process. When the time comes, because I have more questions. And I think other people will too. But when the time comes, I would like to defer the um, uh, consent for the severances and the rezoning. We, we can vote on that as it is. But when the time comes, I defer the severance. And I'll ask other questions once somebody else. I have a couple other questions once other people have asked. Okay. Well Got several other people who want to make comments. Councillor Margetson. Thank you, Your Worship. My my question is related to the irregular lot fronting on Main Street. 
And I, my question is, is there existing services to that lot? And I ask that in the context of condition eight, which says that the water and sanitary from Hill Street will be paid for by the proponent. And it includes the retained lands as well. And also further, if that parcel has existing services and I heard that a house was demolished in the past, it's my opinion that the premise of development was there. It, it was a lot that had a house, it has been used in the past for residential. So that is a factor that I would uh, at least, un it would improve my understanding of whether we could go forward with redeveloping that lot. So that's my question. Is it serviced already? Does it need to be serviced from Hill Street as, as condition eight outlines? And um, the premise of development being that there was a house already there. So if those, that part, that picture could be painted as far as that parcel, that would help me. Thank you. Thanks. That, I guess yeah. it's to you. Through the chair, my understanding is there is services from Main Street and the premise of the development is that there was an existing dwelling there and the zoning bylaw that we've created establishes the building envelope that was previously there before. Um, it was currently it's zoned in an R, I think it's an R1 zone. And um, it would have been a legal non-conforming use had that building still been present. Um, so this new zoning tidies that up. Okay. Councilor Maynard. S sorry, hang Wait. on for a minute. Just if we could back up, Councillor Margetson, did you have a follow-up because you were muted? Yes, thank you. So condition eight to service the retained lands from Hill Street is not completely accurate. And it would be confirmed that existing services are in place for that retained parcel. And, I, and it's had a house and was zoned appropriately. It would be non-conforming, but you're, you're uh, replacing what was once there. Thank you, Matt. And now, Councillor Maynard. Um, thank you. Well, I really, I, I don't have any uh, issues with the um, with the consents on Hill Street. Obviously, the the uh, the concern is with the retained parcel on uh, fronting onto uh, the main street. So, a couple questions to staff. Um, well, actually, one just came up when you said. So, was it legal non-conforming prior to that house being removed? The one I'm facing, would it have been legal non-conforming before it was demolished? I threw the chair. My understanding is the house was demolished in 2009. Our current zoning bylaw has been in place since 2006. So yes, it would have been a legal non-conforming building because of the side yard setbacks and the and the uh, lot frontage. So you don't lose your uh, legal non-conforming once you demolish a building? No. Okay, um, so how would you, because the building has been gone for quite some time, is there accurate enough records that you could de determine the exact footprint of the building that was there so that, so that it's built accordingly? And even if it was legal, not, like what do we do now about setbacks? Or is that just all continuation of the legal non-conforming? Does it have to be at the same, on the same footprint? Uh, through the chair, I've, I've not confirmed that the zoning bylaw is representative of the exact building that was there before. I don't, yeah, I don't, because, yeah, I don't, there's no survey of that. Like, we have pretty good pictures of the ones in Hill Street, but we really don't have uh, any idea what they're going to try and what kind of a tiny house or what they're going to try and put on that, to, on that lot. One final question Is there any way that we can? Uh, that we can uh, approve the severances and put some kind of a hold as opposed to deferring the whole thing on the retained portion? Uh, through the chair, there is options. Um, the, first two, the first two B files could be approved. The retained land would remain with the third B file. So, 
the retained is the small lot, right? Correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So that if that came later, I think it's B14. I don't have all the paperwork in front of me, but um, it would remain as the retained land for until that application came back. It's B13, Matt. B13, yeah. So B13 would, would not be approved tonight, but B11 and B12 could be approved tonight, if that makes sense. You basically make uh, the new uh, parcel that's on Main Street to be attached to one of the Hill Street parcels because it's severing them into two pieces that's the problem. So you keep them together, you free up the first two on Hill Street and the other one rides together as a second. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you, actually, I think I'm good now, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else before I go back to Councillor Nyman? Councillor Bolick. Thank you, Mr. Um, I too have some problems with that uh, retained land. Uh, it looks like a problem waiting to happen uh, with those dimensions. Again, I have a real difficulty in, in conceiving a decent, decent house that would fit into that community and not cause all kinds of problems with the setbacks and stuff. So uh, I would be in favor of not dealing with the retained tonight. And I, I would certainly support approving, I believe it was B11 and B12 to go ahead, but uh, B13 with that retained, I would suggest uh, needs a little more study. Councilor Nyman. Back to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I just want to make sure I understand B11 and B12 is which lots? Uh, through the chair, the, the corner lot at Fairfield and Hill Street, and then the middle lot. Okay, so I have a couple questions then. The existing roadway or, or driveway that goes, uh, enters off of Fairfield Street, I've seen two pictures. It says it shows that roadway is staying. The other one shows it's not. What's happening with that roadway or driveway? Because it crosses all three of those and comes back out onto Hill Street. You might understand that that's a laneway that accesses the rear of the, well, it accesses the rear of the old Picton Manor, and it is not going to be utilized. As, it, it'll be closed. It'll be closed. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the driveway for the house on the corner is on a hill um, by an intersection. Um, how safe is that? Uh, through the chair. So we, we've had development service engineers look at it, and there hasn't been any concern raised to my awareness that um, that that's that's a particular problem. There, there is that existing driveway there. Um, this one's a little bit closer to the side stop sign, but no concerns have been identified. Okay. Uh, can I can carry on, Mr. Mayor? If anybody, just let me see if anybody else has any other questions, and then you can continue with your questions. Nope, don't see anybody. So go okay. ahead. Thank you. Uh, the right away, or, or I guess the assumed right away on the Main Street property, who owns it and what's it there for and what's, uh, what is it gonna be in the future? Matt, any? Yeah, through the chair, just so I'm clear. So you're referring to the right of way that accesses um, the two properties that are close together on Main Street? Off of Main Street, the yeah. two right of way or the right of way there coming off of Main Street. So, so my understanding is that the right of way is in favor of the applicant's land, and that's what is indicated on the survey. And we did hear we did hear something different tonight, and I, I acknowledge that. Um, that was my understanding, but uh, but perhaps we can look at that further. Okay. Um, 
two two other small things. So, uh, has there ever been consideration for environmental assessment of the property? Because uh, we know the building was full of as asbestos, and uh, did it get into the ground? And, and what um, we just need to know if it's what's there, I guess. Yes. Yeah, so through the chair. Um... In terms of asbestos, we know that it was removed off the site. Uh, they received a permit from our building office to, to remove that asbestos. And, um, and it was done by a reputable, reputable company. I did get a copy of the certificate indicating that it had been removed. In terms of an environmental assessment, when going from a commercial or industrial uses to residential, uh, that's something you would typically ask for. Um, when we first looked at this application, we determined that it wasn't a requirement in this case because it was the use was changing from an institutional zone to a residential zone, and that is exempt from the environmental site assessment process. So, if I could ask the clerk one question, um, one of the neighbors provided a uh, copy of some of his um, uh, concerns that he'd like to get addressed. That was that was passed to all of council, was it not? Is this Mr. Ward? Yes. Yep. Okay. So then my question is, how does his concerns get addressed? Uh, so through through the chair, um, I I did speak with Mr. Ward this afternoon, Mike. It, it seems that his, the basis of his concerns are, are um, landscaping and buffering mainly. Um, and so there's questions about the, there's an existing fence and the condition of that fence. And uh, there's also some shrubs, which I believe Mr. Ward maintains. Um, ultimately, in, in, for those two items, these lots will be sold to new, new owners. And um, it'll be up to them to either work with Mr. Ward to rebuild the fence or, uh, or, to, um, or to maintain that shrubbery. We haven't asked for Mr. Cleve to, to retain that. So just a quick follow-up on that is- Then we're gonna move on, yep. How come we, we can ask, when somebody's developing something, we can ask for that to be done and here, we don't want to ask for that. We're going to leave it up for the, to the landowners to do it. That, that don't make sense to me. Either we stay on the same path or, or we're not. So I won't be supporting it until the surrounding landowners um, concerns get addressed in, in some manner. Are you you're refer referring to all the lots, Council Nyman? Yeah, because the the two, the first two lots there, uh, back onto Mr. Ward's property where the laneway is, the bush, the hedge, or whatever, the fence, whatever it is, the, the buffering. So I, I guess if we're if we ask for that all the time and we're not asking it for it here, is that what we're doing going forward? I've got, um, if I could weigh in for a minute, this, this is not, not a particularly clean application. There seem to be um, a number of unanswered questions of concern is, um, you know, making sure that there's been appropriate public consultation. And I think there are some, there's still some answers that, um, need to be provided. So I don't know what the will of council is about this, this matter. Two of the, two of the um, properties, uh, Councillor Bolick has indicated that he's okay with, with those two and improving them. Councillor Maynard, I think, I think registered similarly. So if, um, um, you know, I'd like to, some direction from council is where you'd like to take this and Councillor Nyman, I think you, you stated um, one, one possible option you were entertaining? So I'd like to defer the consents 
for the severances, but the um, the rezoning I'm okay with. Uh, I'm just going back to the thing here. Uh, the rezoning I can support, but the consents I can't because there's just too many unanswered questions about what's happening there. So I'd like to defer the, the consents. Okay. So I can get a seconder for that motion. Or how, how do we do it okay. again? Councillor Forrest, Forrester has indicated that he's going to second that. Madam CAO. Andrew, you, your mayor, um, I, I would suggest that there are, are two different ways to handle this. Either council can look at what is the motion in front of you and choose to deny it or defer it, or a new motion would have to be put on the table to amend this in some way. And I think when uh, Councillor Nyman uh, suggested the idea of uh, retaining the zoning but not the parcels, it was because of the way this motion is written. Uh, Matt was uh, suggesting that it be amended to remove B1320 and zoning bylaw amendment Z1820, uh, which would be the, the way to achieve that. Um, but that doesn't deal with all the issues that were raised by the neighbor that is not here, but submitted written comments. So basically you either have to uh, uh, approve or deny or defer the motion as written, or you have to table a new revised motion that can be voted on. Okay. Councilor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This time I, I preferred to defer this uh, completely. This is very difficult for us to do these sort of uh, applications when they're straightforward, but when they get a little bit more complicated like this, I'd rather do this in the council's chambers or at least when we have a little bit more time to study them. It's very difficult to look at this and listen to everybody from different sides without seeing everything up on the board and getting a full, a good review from staff. But it, it sounds like there's just too many questions. So I do not feel comfortable approving this tonight as it sits. So I'd rather defer the whole motion at this time. Okay. Any other councillor Maynard? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I, I too, just, I think now that a, a, a full deferral is, is in order. Um, when we start talking about uh, tabling a new revised motion, normally that would mean it would get sent back anyways, because you know trying to, uh, to on the fly do a, a revised motion can be tricky. And um, Councillor Nyman has actually brought to attention, you know, like where that laneway was, I wasn't, and it's hard without it being up where they can, you know, point out to us. The, and the pictures here, the uh, GIS is not even at the whole property. So I think that uh, a little uh, further look and especially on the um, appropriate placing of a, uh, of a home on that, uh, on that small lot, considering our urban and uh, guidelines and compatible to adjacent homes. All right, anybody? Else want to weigh in here? Councillor Nyman, do you want to put something out? Um, through, through your worship, if I may, Councillor yep, Forrester, Forrester already made that motion. We just need a second okay. deferral. Councillor Nyman, Councillor Nyman is seconding it. Councillor Margaretson, you had something to say? Yes, thank you. Madam Clerk, I just wanted I, I'm, I just wanted to say that I would support a deferral based on some of the unanswered questions and the concerns raised this evening. Um, I wouldn't want to table a new motion or deny this. Yeah. And I will say that notwithstanding the concerns of the neighbors, I support support infilling where we can. Yep. on an existing lot that was serviced and was developed at one time. And I also believe that a small house can be tastefully placed on a lot within the context of the streetscape. So, but I, I think the questions that were, uh, came up about the right of way and I, I see the concept plan or the uh, also has those two lines. So it would be nice to understand with a real survey or sketch where the right of way is and who it's in, how it's in favor of the adjacent lands. And then perhaps we could 
be in a better position to make a, a decision on this. So I would support the deferral. All right, so we have a, uh, Madam Clerk, can you read the, the motion, Councillor Forrester, the motion? Absolutely, through you, your worship. This is a Forrester Nyman motion that report DS31-2020 of Development Services dated March 18th, 2020 regarding consent file numbers B11-20, B12-20, B13-20, and zoning bylaw amendment file number Z8-20 be deferred to a future council meeting. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, all those in favor of the deferral? Show your hands, please. Okay, that carries. So now we have to go back to the original motion. Nope. No? Nope. Okay, nope. we're good. Nope. Okay. All right, thank you. So this moves us to item 9.6, which is a Bolick Harper motion. Um, through your worship, before we do that, can you read the rights of- Oh yeah, my apologies. Uh, yeah, within 15 days of council's decision, notice of decision will be mailed out as prescribed advising of the decision, the conditions, if any, and the date on which the 20 day appeal period to the local planning appeal tribunal expires. If no appeals are received, council's decision is final. Any person who wishes to receive notice of decision of council must submit a written request to the municipal clerk. So now we will move to item 9.6, which is Councillor Bullock. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a Bullock Harper motion that the planning public council now rise and resume sitting as council. Thank you. All those in favor? And that carries. So that moves us to items for consideration. And item um, 10.1, and we need, uh, I need a mover for that. Seconded by Councillor Nyman, if we could have a mover for this, this motion. Not all at once, everybody. Councillor Bailey, seconded by Councillor Nyman, if you could read, read this, please. This is a Bailey Nyman motion that council received report DS hyphen 42 uh, 2020 for information and that council approved the development charge rates that were applicable on December 2018 for any development whose building permits are issued in the year 2020 for building one on parcel A of the Picton Properties Development Site in Picton. Okay, thank you. Questions? Councillor St. Jean. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I guess my, the single biggest question I have with regards to uh, this development and, and the, the uh, DC charges rebates is what is the precedent we are setting uh, followed by how many, uh, how many other developers are gonna be coming at us for a very similar reduction and what are the dollar values we're looking at? To whomever would like to answer that question, I guess, <laughs> or those questions. That's a question of, um, I guess, Peter or Madam CAO? Yeah. Um, we lost Matt and Matt is part and parcel of this report. So we'll try to get him back online, but I'll, I will um, provide an answer for you. So as far as, I don't believe that we really set precedents in, in, in like, unlike a court of law. Um, but, you know, obviously it's an example. What we, we don't have a whole lot of, we don't have any other developments that are similar to this that have taken the multi years to get through a process. Uh, the most recent one would be the, the hub daycare, which they started their process in August, have yet to get their building permit. Uh, and that's about 4,000 square feet. So that would be one example of where perhaps they could come back and ask the same thing. But other than that, we're not aware of any other developments that, that fall in this category and certainly not multi-year 
this one started in 2016. And at, at that time in 2016, there really, there was no sunset date on the discount. It was, it was there was no date at all. So there was really no, there was really no indication that it was going to end. Although as Jamie pointed out in his presentation that he realizes that bylaws or by nature can, will change from time to time. It wasn't until 2018 that there actually was a sunset date and that was for the, for the 2019. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, unless Matt can add to that, uh, as far as we know, there really aren't any other developments that fall into the same category. Okay. Thank you for that clarity. Okay, Councillor, um, Councillor Prinzen, then Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mayor Ferguson. I, uh, I too have some concerns such as uh, Councillor St. Jean and I'm just reporting back to Mr. Chisholm's presentation where he, uh, where he says, it, was it not for MTO or the EA process, this center would have likely been operational. So that, that raises flags in my head is, is this a county problem that this center is not going? Why should the county be on the hook for uh, the development charges, if it, if we, you know, maybe we are a little bit of the reason, but are we the true reason why this center is not going? So, uh, for the precedent reason, for pulling that quote out of his presentation, um, I will not be supporting staff recommendation tonight on this, on this item. Thank you. Councillor Nyman has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah. I have the same kind of same concerns um, as Councilor Prinson and St. Jean. Um, but but uh, there was um, remarks made about the inch and a half to pay for another service. Um, and I just need to understand it. So the inch and a half service, if I heard it right, is going to feed the the new building, um, but is that inch and a half service enough for fire suppression? Okay, so you're talking about connection charges. The report, the decision that needs to be made is in regards to development charges. So uh, on the connection charge side, sorry, did, did I cut someone off? I heard a, I heard a voice. No, okay. Go ahead. On the connection charge side, uh, it, so it was serviced. And so the, the connection charge bylaw does allow for where there is an existing service, they get credit for that. Um, it, it's worded in such a way that if, if there was dollars exchanged, they would get those dollars back. But this was, this, this pipe was in the ground way before this bylaw was in place. So what we did was we looked at the, um, the size of that would feed their domestic supply. And in talking with the CBO who, is, who administers the connection charge bylaw, they don't, currently we don't, we don't charge people for fire suppression lines. Um, they're, not, they're not billed for on a connection charge for it. And uh, they're not even billed uh, on a monthly basis for it. Uh, in the water bylaw, there's, there's not water use bylaw. There is no specific charge for a fire suppression line. So we, we, we disregarded the fire suppression need for it and looked at just what the building, the, the main building would need. And their engineer confirmed that that inch and a half line would have been uh, more than sufficient to, to provide the domestic supply. So that's on the connection charge side, but I think you know, the, the decision that's before you is, is uh, in regards to the, the development charge reduction. Councilor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I was never really in agreement with the reduction of DC charges, but I'm just going to ask a question. I think I already know the answer. So how much of this DC reduction, if we did go ahead with this, would be paid by the general tax base? Because it's not just like we're cutting in half. Where does that additional money Peter. come from? Peter? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. The, so the amount is roughly fifty thousand yeah. dollars and that every year there is a what's called a development incentive 
uh, budget item. And so, for example, this year I'm told that it's somewhere in a 325,000 range, and that covers off for last year's development charge incentive. Uh, so, next year, if, if this gets approved, that $50,000 gets funded through that, but then that that is made up by the tax base. Thank you, and that's the answer. That's the answer I already knew, but I just want to make that clear to make sure everybody is aware of that out there. That yes, giving a reduction. These are difficult times, and all businesses are going to have to deal with this. But I don't think this is the right time to be adding this onto our general tax base right now. So I, I will not be able to support this. Okay, Madam CAO. Uh uh, through you, the chair, I just wanted to clarify that any discount we approve this evening, should the council decide to support the staff recommendation, it would come out of next year's budget. We're always a year behind in terms of uh, these, uh, the way this gets played out. But just for clarity, uh, you're not wrong, Councillor Forrester, about the rate base, but the amount is not paid in, in this uh, calendar year. Councillor Margotson. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to point out that it's a fifty thousand uh, dollar difference, of course, but that's on the net uh, square footage, and that property, as I'm reading this, got credit for sixteen thousand square feet, and I knew the office building, and there were a bunch of portables and an open storage structure on there. So they're already getting a credit for 16,000 square feet, uh, reducing, that's quite a reduction in itself, in my opinion. And there might be some loopholes or maybe our, our DC bylaw could be tightened up in its definition of existing buildings and structures that are serviced. So um, I have a little trouble with that number and the reduction as well as uh, cutting the DCs in half for the net square footage. So I think you can see from what I'm saying how I feel about this. Um, and I'm a bit concerned about um, that going forward that the taxpayers are gonna be responsible. And I understand his concerns and the patience that he must have had to have to go through all this, but it, it is the development process. And um, so that's, that's my feelings about this. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Council Maynard. Sorry, I think you had your hand up. That's okay. That's fine. Um, thank you. Well, so I think the, the comment that this was a standing bylaw. So when this uh, bylaw was um, with this reduction to the uh, development charges was passed, it was passed with the caveat that it was reviewed annually. And uh, so every year council had a, uh, had a look at how much we had spent and the, you know, the first year was bad and the second year. Now, well, once we get up over the $300,000 a year mark that uh, was coming directly from the uh, ratepayers to, uh, to top up those DC funds, it became less palatable. So I think it's, I would say that um, there was many discussions and many close votes on whether it would proceed from, from year to year. So finally in 2018, we, um, and, and we left a, a long uh, sun, sunset clause to allow any of the developers that were, you know, in the queue or getting close to, uh, to, um, to, to finish up. Um, the, now, I, I don't know whether it would be normal to expect between a, uh, an almost complete application on December 18th to, uh, to have development approvals um, and building permits issued by the following September. That seems a little aggressive, but uh, I, I just want to say that when we're talking about, um, if we're doing this under that principle of fairness, I would, have, I would think that we would have to be the primary cause for the delay and in my opinion the um the inability to get the approvals from the mto for a for an entrance was probably the uh, the primary um was one of the uh, large pieces of the of the delay 
Um, the county has, in my opinion, worked very well to try and facilitate this process. I would hate to guess how much um, you know extra staff time has been uh, has put into this to allow this de development to go through. And uh, early on, there was um, considerable um, public um, outcry about this that you know, slowed the process a little bit. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll just say that the reduced DC charges were, in my opinion, from the inception, always uh, intended to be temporary. And once they were extended, we did leave a, a long uh, sunset clause. Um, so I, I worry also about the precedent that this might set for other developers that, that are in the queue. And if we're talking about the principle of fairness, I think that we also have to be uh, fair to the ratepayers who pick up these uh, these reductions in the uh, in the in the uh, development charge. So, uh, I although I want to see this development go forward, I, I don't think that this is an appropriate uh, measure to appropriate measure to take. Peter, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. If I so just on the point that you made, Councillor Maynard, about the, the principle of fairness and relying on the fact of whether or not the, the, it would be a county um, delay or not, my understanding of the clergy versus Mississauga case law um, boiled down to what the intent was. was. Was there an intent on the developer's part to you know, rush this through in haste to try to, to, try to beat a deadline? Was the uh, and conversely, was there an intent on the on the municipality's portion to try to basically pull the rug underneath uh, and 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 get the development charge done quickly? So in order to cash in on a large development, and neither one of those are true, right? I mean, so th there was really no intent for anyone to um, have him or have have this developer not have take advantage of this reduction. It started. Uh, three three to three and a half years uh, before that the eventual end date so for all intents and purposes as as the developer was working through the process um, I think it was fair and reasonable to expect that he was going to be able to to take advantage of that uh, yes it was a very complicated sophisticated um, you know even down to uh, you as members of council had to lobby uh, in order to get this work this out with MTO and that took months and months on its own. Eventually we got MTO to agree to, to a new municipal street and there, there was agreements that had to be formed. There was land swaps. Initially when this developer came to the table, it, it, that, that was not ever foreseen by us or by the developer. Um, and then so the fact that, you know, he's the building, the building uh, permit application is submitted um you know and i guess in hindsight he right after he got site plan control approval he could have rushed to get an application in albeit uh, uh, they might not have been complete drawings but there would have been drawings there that uh, at least that suffice for the site plan but he didn't do that he wasn't necessarily trying to uh, beat the system and get something in trying to sneak it in before the deadline uh, so I, I think the intentions were were clear and honest on both sides, and that's something that this, the that the clergy case took into major consideration and how they ruled it. They said in, in the principle of fairness, both sides had in, had intended for this to happen. It, it just in this situation, which is similar to that situation, uh, you know, time just got time slipped. Time got the better of both sides on this one, and. Through no fault, it's, it's just it's just the way it happened. So just to clarify that item, it's yeah, it, we don't I don't we don't believe that the fairness is, relies on the fact that there had to be some fault on the on the side of the municipality. Any other comments? I see any other hands. Follow Can, up. Yeah, follow up, Councilor Manor. Yeah, thank you. Um, so. In the report on page 111, it says that the, um, the uh, application, I'll bet partially completed, was submitted in December 2018, 
does it seem reasonable that a uh, partially submitted application in 2018 in normal course would be at the uh, building permit stage by um, by uh, September of 2019? That seems that seems outside of our normal for that for that uh, complexity of a what does it say? You need uh, well, there was still, there was still quite a bit of work to be done at that point. And I and I guess I'll finish because I'll, I won't get I'll, I'll ask for the answer to that question. But at the end of the day, it comes down to to fairness. In my opinion, it comes down to what's fair for the um, for the ratepayers in general that will have to uh, that will have to pick up the, the cost of this reduction. So is that a question to Peter? Well, the first yeah, part yeah. was a question yeah. about it being a reasonable that a. Yeah. Uh, incomplete or partially completed application submitted yeah. December 18th would in normal process be at the um, ready to uh, pull build, build, building permits yeah. in September. Peter? So through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, I, if this was a typical situation where we would just receive the application at that point, then, then possibly not. But you got to remember, we had been working on this with the developer for since spring of 2016, and a lot of the items had already been previously talked about and discussed. And so when we received it in 2018, although we it was still missing some aspects of it, uh, a lot of the homework had been done. A lot of a lot of the the background and understanding, and a lot of the hoops had been already been fulfilled. The studies were complete. Uh, so I, I don't think it's unreasonable to 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 expect that we could have he could have gotten to a um, you know, to a point of building permit nine months after that. Yeah, so what happened? Yeah, Councillor Margetson. Yeah, I I I sympathize with the length of time in dealing with MTO and the municipality. I think at times it takes unheard of patience, but at the same time, I want to reiterate that I feel there's been quite a credit for the existing buildings. And I don't want to minimize the point that I'm making 16,000 square feet for the buildings on that site is a considerable credit. So I feel that already at the full price is another 50,000. So I, I, that's why I'm not supporting it because I think a credit has already been given so that's that's my view. Uh, Three, Mr. Mayor, and, Mayor and just, just to in. clarify, that credit would have been given uh, regardless. I mean that, that that's an entitlement credit. So that would have been if this would have been if he would have met the date, um, he would have got the credit and then also gotten the discount. So just just so that everyone's aware of that, I'm not disputing. What, what you're saying, Council Marguson, I'm just trying to make it clear that 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 is not a you know that's not a discount. It's it's a credit for existing square footage. Okay. Uh, okay. So I just want to um, just weigh in. I I want to, in the case of Mr. Chisholm, he has um, he has been a uh, terrific to deal with. He's kept in touch with the municipality. He has certainly had his challenges with the MTO, um, certainly had challenges with some of the processes that were um, in place in terms of uh, our operation, but those have been, you know, we're going to hear later in the month about amendments to some of those operations. But I, I do have to, as much as I sympathize with um, the timing of all this, you know, my view is that we've got to look at this within the context of where we are right now, particularly given, um, you know, the stresses that our ratepayers may be under uh, as we move out of um, the COVID-19 crisis. I'm, I'm less concerned about the precedent um, uh, matter than I am about the, uh, the you know rolling anything anything more onto our rate 
on our rate payers score. So as as much as I was would love to support support this because Mr. Chisholm has been uh, in my mind a um, a terrific developer and terrific to deal with, I don't feel I can do it at this time. So I'm going to I'm going to call the vote now if I could. Um, all those in favor of the motion as it's been presented. Um, through you, Your Worship, if I may, we'll do the roll call as we've been doing for the past. Oh, yeah. few Sorry, you're right. Councillor Bailey. Opposed. Councillor Bullock. Opposed to. <clears throat> Councillor Forrester. Opposed to. Councillor Harper. Opposed to. Councillor Hirsch. Opposed to. Councillor McNaughton. Opposed. Councillor Margotson. Opposed. Councillor Maynard. Opposed to. Councillor McMahon. Opposed to. Councillor Nyman. Opposed to. Councillor Prinzen. Opposed to. Councillor St. Jean. Opposed to. Mayor Ferguson. Opposed. And that loses 12 to 0. Moves us on to uh, item 10.2, which is a St. Jean McNaughton motion. <coughs> Councillor St. Jean. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a St. Jean McNaughton motion that Council receive report DS 49 2020 for information and that Council approve and enact the new bylaw to regulate and govern taxicab, limousine businesses, and delivery businesses regularly used for hire, their owners and operators in the County of Prince Edward. And if I may speak to it, sir? Uh, you may, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank staff for going back and, and reworking it. Uh, I know that a number of us received uh, uh, concerns about the rate structure particularly and I for one am satisfied that uh, 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 with the new rate structure it will be more fair for all parties including the residents while it seems like a hefty increase you have to remember how long those prices have been in place uh, I see that it is it strikes a balance and therefore I believe it's uh, it's time to move forward and uh, uh, approve this new rate structure. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilor McNaughton. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of things. At first, I'd, I'd like to confirm with the clerk that uh, the um, words that were reviewed referring to minors was restored because I wasn't able to find an updated copy. Did I understand you correctly that it would say minors and vulnerable persons? That's to Catalina. Clerk. Madam Clerk. Through your worship, yes, that language has been added to the bylaw, I believe, is in section 22. Yes. Um, thank you. So I just wasn't able to view the updated copy. Thanks. So um, I, I think that this is a, a vast improvement. I still would have preferred to see a wider radius for uh, close to town trips, including the heights. Um, what I, but I, but I think it's much, much better. Um, the, the automatic increase in 2022 I would refer I would prefer for that to come to council for review at that time instead of being triggered automatically is that uh, so I, I don't know uh, how other people would feel about it but it would certainly be something I would like to see okay. other questions Councillor Harper 
Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Andy, question to Andy. The uh, I'm just looking at the um, the bylaw itself. Um, it says that a uh, number of taxis issued, no more than 30 taxi play, uh, taxi cab license shall be issued. Do we have 30 out there right now, or do we have less than that? Your wish, worship, uh, we have uh, about 20 cabs right now. Okay, so so therefore, there's room for another another ten should competition arise at some point, and somebody else yeah. wanted to get in the cab business. Yes, there is room for expansion. <clears throat> okay, yeah, my my reason for asking the question is is the um, I think the Picton rates are great. I think that's fair. It just it's the issue of Wellington, and you know the. Um, uh, the way it was written uh, and previously, uh, as you indicated, didn't really work um, for the cab companies. I guess what I'm thinking of is the, the pattern of, of taxi use um, and whether it's changing. You know, if you've got people that are in Hillier and want to go to Wellington, um, if I understand the bylaw properly, there's quite a large pickup rate for them to make that trip. So it's really a question of have we got um, sufficient opportunity for competition in the way it's written should should people see uh, opportunities in the west end um, to do something a little different than what's currently offered uh through your worship i i yeah, believe yeah. there is yep yeah, is there um they can uh yeah they can expand and those fees are a maximum fee so they don't have to charge that amount so if there was somebody that worked out of wellington they could charge a different fare if they saw fit and we could address it if at some point there is demand for taxi in wellington right and that's that's the reason i would support kate uh councillor mcnaughton's thought just you know things are changing rapidly and uh, i'd hate to see that we eliminated or limited rather um you know competitive offerings Absolutely. thank you Now there we are. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions. Um, the first is, uh, according to this bylaw, all taxi cabs must be licensed within uh, Prince Edward County. So I'm looking at specifically people who live in Caring Place and don't need to get a taxi into Trenton, or people in Rossmore going to Belleville. Now, I know a lot of the people will take a Trenton cab in back home into the county or a Belleville cab into the county. How does it work the other way? Do they, how's the cross border things work just for the public knowledge? Um, for someone to do a pickup in the county, they are supposed to be licensed in the county. Um, so if they were picked up in Belleville and brought into the county, that's fine. But if you had somebody that was getting picked up in Amelia'sburg to go to Trenton or Belleville, really they should be licensed in the county. Okay. Should I'll, be. But I'll, I'll yeah. Um, so our, our licensed taxi cab operators within the county, are they all located in the Picton and, and Wellington area? Picton. Uh, Picton only at this time. So somebody up in, in the north end that needs to go into one of our neighboring communities needs to call a taxi that's going to be based out of Picton uh, to, to, to maintain um, compliance with the bylaw. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. So I see that as a potential problem, especially as we put the rates up, both for the operators and, and for the consumers who have to pay for that taxi to come all the way up. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether... Um, that needs to be tweaked or whether we can get into some kind of an agreement with our neighboring communities as far as cross-border transportation of people. I have contacted uh, Central Taxi in the past to see if they were interested in licensing of one or two vehicles of theirs in the county to be able to do their pickups, but got no response. But you haven't had any discussions with, with the licensing authorities in 20 West and Belleville? Uh, you froze, Andy.
Andy is frozen, so. Do you have an easier question? <laughs> well, Maybe it's we'll the wait, question. We'll wait till he unfreezes. Anyways, yeah, I, I mean, it goes beyond the scope of what we're discussing tonight, but I think yeah. now that the taxi is, is on the, uh, there, there are some issues that perhaps we should continue to further, and, and, and I don't want to sort of hold up progress here, but obviously there are some other issues that have to be revisited here as far as providing good taxi service to our residents. Else have their hand up, Councilor McNaughton. Yes, uh, but my question was for Andy. <laughs> so, um, but maybe um, CAO I, Wallace I, can answer it. Um, were so have license fees. So when this bylaw, the new bylaw was being written, were license fees actually considered for an update too because they are the same as they were a decade ago or 14 years ago? Do you know? Sorry, I no. don't, I don't That's know. Andy. That's okay. Thank you. Thanks for trying. Is, is, Andy, is Andy back, Madam Clerk? I to your work. To your worship, it seems to be that he's lost connection. So maybe we can take that five minute break right now since we're close to that. The two hour mark. Two hour okay. mark. Uh, because I, yeah, I have a question of Andy as well as to the consultation with the other, um, the other uh, taxi companies. So if we're- um, Andy's back. Oh, Andy's oh. back? Okay, so the uh, uh, Councilor McNaughton, did you have something to bring forward to? Sure, but did to Andy? did Andy need to finish dealing with Councilor Bullock's question first, or I don't know that Andy heard Council the yeah. Councilor Bullock's comment. Why don't no, you I'm reiterate that again, Councilor Bullock? About uh, you know, this is something that we have to look at, and you know, to improve taxi service generally. Yeah. yeah, so the question basically is, uh, have you, and if not, uh, can you have discussions with your counterparts in the regulating authorities in both Quinney West and Belleville as far as some kind of agreement as to if their taxis are licensed in, in one of the municipalities that they can do a certain amount of pickups and the other just to streamline our service? Yeah, we can have that discussion. I think it'd be worthwhile. And it may, uh, um, some of our cabs might uh, want some input in that. Maybe they could pick up in Belleville or have a uh, reciprocal agreement. So it is worthwhile to look into. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, Council McNaughton, do you have a question now? now that that same track. question, but did, yes, now that, hi, Andy. Welcome back. Um, so I, I actually am curious if you did look at license fees because they haven't changed in, I guess, about 14 years. Is that something that you did uh, look at as well? Yes, I did have a look at our license fees and our license fees are actually higher than our neighboring municipalities, especially for uh, the second and third vehicles are were equivalent on the one vehicle, but as they add more vehicles, we're charging like $150 for a license. Other places are charging $25 or $50. So our fees are a little bit higher than the neighboring municipalities per vehicle. Thank you. Anybody else? I've got one question, Andy, about the, uh, the consultation. Um, Wayne Cronk, Terry Rand, and uh, Rick Marshall were, were um, all consulted about the, the rate structure, the revised rate structure, and are uh, generally in agreement with it? Uh, through you, Your Worship, yes, they are. Okay. So leading up to this meeting, they've, they've, they've been involved and engaged, which is- Yes, they have. Okay. All right, so we'll call the uh, the vote on this item, uh, Madam Clerk. To your worship, Councillor McNaughton has her hand up regarding a, maybe a friendly amendment. 
Uh, I didn't didn't see that. Go ahead. So I am wondering if we could amend it, and I'm sorry, I've lost my place here to exclude um, to exclude the automatic increase in 2022 and leave that for the next council to um, to approve. Okay, have you got a seconder? No, but is that necessary? Councillor Harper? Councillor Harper? So, yeah, sorry. Um, yes, I'd second uh, Councillor McNaughton's uh, friendly motion right. amendment. Catalina would. Madam Clerk? <coughs> Through you, Your Worship. The amendment moved by Councillor McNaughton, seconded by Councillor Harper, that the proposed rate increase in 2022 be brought forward to a future council. Okay. Councillor Forrester, have a question about the amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Well, at this time, I can't support this. One of the big problems, and if you look at any business, is having some sort of stability and be able to plan for the future. If you're looking to uh, improve your fleet, uh, It'd be nice to know you had consistent uh, rate changes that you could plan that. If not, you can say, okay, instead of buying two cars next year, well, I might hold off. If it comes to the new council, it's not a priority right now. It's another year. So I would like to see some consistency right now and taking it through this term of council. This is our term that we can deal with. So I, I can't support that because of that reason. Councilor St. Jean, to the amendment. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, speaking to the amendment, um, I, I agree with Councillor Forrester on this. Uh, on, he raised a couple of the points I was going to, but the other thing that I'd like to uh, uh, to state is I am not a fan of kicking the can down the road to another council. Uh, bear in mind that in 2022, you will have a new council. They will not have the benefit of our uh, <laughs> collective experience on this particular file. And uh, th therefore, I don't think that it serves uh, the businesses or the community good to, like I say, kick it down the road and uh, to another council. I, uh, businesses need stability. The community needs stability. This is this forms that stability by by having an, a, a, a regulated and recommended rate of increase at a specific point in time. So I will not support the amendment. Okay. The amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I would actually point out that if it was to be deferred to the next council to look at, we're looking at 2023. The elections in 2022, but the new council wouldn't sit to 2023 to uh, to reconsider this. So I agree with Councillor Forrester and Councillor St. Jean that we should leave this motion the way it is. Thank you. Okay. Else to speak to the amendment. No, okay, well, the, the amendment's on the floor, right, Madam Clerk? So we've got a vote on that? Well, whatever. Well, no, did you have your hand up, Councillor McNaughton? Because I didn't, I I didn't did. see it. I did. Well, I, I, it would be fine for it to come to 2022. I, Councillor Hirsch was quite right. Uh, the, the next council wouldn't really be getting going until 2023. So, but I, I just think we've got some un, unpredictable uh, years ahead of us for the next two years. And, and I would like to see decisions like this sort of be reviewed before they're automatically adopted. So that's why I would put this forward. So let's vote on the amendment. Yep. Madam Clerk. Thank you, uh, Councillor McNaughton. Um, in favor of Councillor Margotson. Opposed. Councillor Maynard. In favor. Councillor McMahon. Opposed to. Councillor Nyman. Opposed to. Councillor Prinzen. Opposed to. <laughs> Councillor St. Jean. Opposed to. Councillor Bailey. Opposed to. Councillor Bolick. 
Opposed to? Councillor Forrester. Opposed. Councillor Harper. Well, I was with you, Kate, so I'm in favor. I'm sticking with you, Kate, on this one. <laughs> Councillor Hirsch. Opposed to. Mayor Ferguson. Opposed. And the amendment loses nine to four. Now we vote on the main motion. Correct. Okay. Moved by Councillor St. Jean, seconded by Councillor McNaught. Councillor St. Jean. In favor of. Councillor Bailey. In favor of. Councillor Bolick. In favor of. Councillor Forrester. In favor. Councillor Harper. In favor. Councillor Hirsch. In favor of. Councillor McNaughton. In favor of. Councillor Markitson. In favor of. Councillor Maynard. In favor of. Councillor McMahon. In favor of. Councillor Nyman. In favor of. Councillor Prinzen. In favor of. Mayor Ferguson. In favor. And to prove I can count, that carries 13 to zero. <laughs> so uh, we are now finished 10.2, moving to 10.3, and we'll take a 10 minute break. Okay. 10 minute recess. Okay. So we've got back in 10 minutes, everybody.
Stewart, where's all the candy? I don't have any underneath my desk here. Hey, Jamie, I got a Mento if you want one. You know, it's interesting, Steve, even with the boat launches open, I've hardly seen any boats on our lake at all. Can't hear you. You're muted. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the report. That, um, it's down. Still got getting calls about it. Dear Your Worship, uh, we're just, we said it would be 10 minutes. Um, yep. And just a reminder that while we're on break, everyone can hear what we're saying when we're not muted, which is okay. But just a reminder that people may have heard people asking for candy and whatnot, which is hilarious. Well, that's, yeah, that's a, we kind of missed that part of this. <clears throat> you know, it's just like high school, you heard, Primary school, you pass a bunch of candies under your desk. Same thing happens in council chambers. We'll just give the CAO a couple of minutes to rejoin. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Go ahead, Your Worship. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. So everybody's back. Uh, we are now at item 10.3, and this is a Bailey McNaughton motion. Councillor Bailey. This is a Bailey McNaughton motion uh, that the resignation by Les Stanfield from the Environmental Advisory Committee be received and that a letter of appreciation be sent to Les Stanfield. And I'll have a question about this, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Um, questions, go, go ahead, Councillor Bailey. Uh, in 10.3 through 10.6, we're accepting resignations. Are we replacing these people specifically? Madam Clerk, you had something to, you had a comment about this, anticipating this question? Yes, uh, through your worship in response to Councillor Bailey, why some of the recruitment efforts aren't beginning with some of the committees is that we are under uh, the process of starting a committee review. So Environmental Advisory Committee is one of the committees where the terms of reference are being uh, reviewed uh, in, to ensure consistency, to clarify roles, and given the size of the committee, there is no uh, imminent need to recruit an additional member as in the terms of reference, it says uh, up to five public members and there was five. So with the resignation of um, Mr. Stanfield, there is four. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, all those in favor? And that carries. Lose 10.4, Councillor uh, Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's a Forster Maynard motion that the resignation by Rick Conroy from the Community Economic Development Commission be received and that a letter of appreciation be sent to Rick Conroy. Thank you. Questions? Okay, all those in favor? And that carries. 10.5, Councilor McNaughton. Um, thank you. This is a McNaughton Hirsch motion that the resignation by Stephen Levitt from the Picton Recreation Committee be received and that a letter of appreciation be sent to Stephen Levitt. Thank you. Questions? I've got one now that we're halfway through these. Madam Clerk, letter of appreciation. Who is the letter of appreciation being sent by? Me? Correct, Your Worship. It's okay, a letter that... that that's fine. Just want to clarify that for everybody. And um, just while we're on the topic, this is uh, a new motion that you're all seeing. T typically, we don't send set letters of appreciation, but we thought it's a process that we should start to thank our volunteers. And also just to clarify, um, as we receive resignations, uh, Council's really fantastic about um, acknowledging them. Um, but just a reminder for those watching at home that we don't discuss the reasons why somebody resigns unless they give the explicit um, the explicit ability for counsel or the permission of counsel to discuss the reasons why they resign as per the resignation letter. So that is our process. And it's just for those at home wondering why there are so many resignations and why we're not necessarily delving into the topic of why. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so we'll vote on that. All those in agreement? And that carries. 10.6, uh, Councillor McNaughton again. Thanks. This is a McNaughton Maynard motion that the council appoint Rua Gauti to the Picton Recreation Committee for the term of council or until reappointed. And that a letter of, uh, sorry, and that a letter of appointment be sent to Rua Gauti. Okay, questions? All those in favor? Thank you, 10.7, uh, 10 Councillor Margotson. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. A Margotson McMahon motion that the resignation of Nathan Landstra from the Heritage Advisory Committee be received and that a letter of appreciation be sent to Nathan Landstra and 
that recruitment efforts for a replacement heritage committee member commence using existing 2019 applications. Okay, any questions, comments? All those in favor? And that carries. Item 10.8, this is Councillor Harper. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thanks Mr. Mayor. This is a uh, Harper Prinzen motion that the items approved under delegated authority to CAO during COVID-19 pandemic be received. Thank you. Um, any questions concerning this? Any hands? Councillor Margotson. Okay, I had a question regarding um, the contract for the construction of Street A and associated buried infrastructure in Highway 33. And my question was related to, I think it's at the bottom of page 223, where it says part of the costs will be paid by development charges. And it says what part on the top of the next page. And if I could just get an explanation on the breakdown of the 74%, why it's 74%, and then where the remainder is funded from, please. I think those are the right page numbers, but. Yeah, 224 and 223. Through you, uh, the chair. Um, so I, I don't have that level of detail with me uh, right now. Um, if I recall correctly, it is, um, so it is related to what our DC bylaw allows uh, to be charged back versus not, but I certainly can um, get back to council with more information on how that's calculated in this particular site. Yes, and I, just a follow up. Yep. It's just that I, it's been drilled into my head by Councillor Nyman that development pays for, for infrastructure and, and um, improvements. So I just want to make sure that we have an understanding who's paying for it and how it's broken down. And if I could just ask one further small question or maybe make a comment. I noticed that the project management and I believe it's site supervision, I don't have it in front of me. It was about $350,000 for this project, which is a $2.5 million project, which accounts for about 14%, which based on my experience is quite a high number, um, the consulting fees of 324,000. And I don't know the details of the project. I don't know if there's a sanitary lift station. I know it's a, it's a signalization, which, even that is, is mostly an ESA approval. So, and I know it's approved, but I just want to make sure that we're as diligent as we can on keeping our consulting fees in check uh, because I saw that number is quite a high percentage of the total value. And that's a comment I wanted to make. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilor McNaughton. Thank you. Uh, I, this is a question for Madam CAO, I'm just, I'm looking at the Municipal Community Grants Report that um, that now is being reconfigured or that has been reconfigured with uh, COVID-19 and, you know, timeframes that have, that are not going to be realized for a lot of events and organizations. Uh, but I would like to sort of, have you outlined what the options are going forward for utilizing those funds? Uh, and also, do you currently um, do you currently have discretion under um, under your um, current powers to move funds to organizations that are reconfiguring their offering? Uh, if it seems to still be a valid concern, or is that something that would have to go back to the foundation? Is that clear? Yeah, it's clear. It's just complicated. <laughs> so, it is. 
Uh, through your worship, um, so to answer the question about uh, sort of next steps. So the intention was to move as quickly as possible to give some certainty to the groups that were funding or um, clearly not funding either because they weren't recommended by the foundation and or their projects don't make sense now uh, because of COVID. And as you see in, in that report, there's a middle chunk that were um, staff recommended we hang on to the money and kind of in escrow and, and wait and see if their, if their project could work uh, depending on how we move through the provincial phases. I think that um, a next step could be that council directs staff to uh, uh, reopen a window for uh, another round of funding so that now that we have a better sense of where we're going or you know, in, in several weeks when we have even more clarity, uh, we could uh, reopen and use the remainder of the funding to figure out what is the uh, best way to move forward. Uh, I think that is, um, technically might be within the emergency powers, but certainly not within the spirit of the emergency authority that was uh, given to the CAO role in the bylaw. So I would suggest that be something that council uh, direct us to do. Um, and then we would, I would recommend that be uh, done with the community foundation playing their normal role. So, uh, but it would be like a, a second round with whatever money is left over. Uh, or anything else the council wanted to add to it. Yeah. So follow up? Yes, go ahead. So do you see that being something that we should be adding to a future committee of the whole sort of within the next couple of months or um, how would you envision that practically? The timing might be appropriate. Um, I think that I think because it's fairly straightforward coming off of this report. I mean, if there's uh, if it's the will of council and you want to pass a motion to direct us to revisit that, or you may wish to wait for a bit and then and then ask for that motion later. But I don't necessarily think that you need another report from staff to make that happen. No. It's a pretty direct uh, motion. So when you feel that that's appropriate, I do know that there are uh, some. Um, organizations that uh, were not given funding as a result of this report who do have an interest of coming back before council and I expect that um, either late May or early June you're gonna see at least one of them bring forward a deputation so that'll give you another opportunity to revisit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Councilor Nyman. Mayor, I have two questions. Um, so the first one is a uh, the grants. So I just want to make sure I understanding. So the last uh, couple pages of it, uh, 294 and 295, those are the applications that were just submitted. They didn't receive any grants. Is that true? Madam Clerk or Madam uh, CAO? Um, so I'm, I'm unmuted. Okay. I'm just uh, looking through the document now. So you're talking about the append, it's been a while since I read this, so I just don't want to get it wrong. Um, this, the, so the uh, attachment A is the list of those that we are, it's a combination of those of the ones that we're recommending be awarded and those that we, um, basically put in the holding category that they um, could potentially work with the right conditions and restrictions. Uh, so those are um, the ones that we are holding back. So in the report, it speaks to three categories of projects. And uh, so that, that I would review that table uh, in the appendix as basically the, the projects that still have a chance. Some of them have been, the ones that say um, were uh, recommended for approval have already received letters informing them of that. And those that were in that conditional basket, if they can think about how to redesign the way they would deliver that, um, we could revisit that um, should the provincial orders of limiting five people, which is one of the major restrictions, if that changes, then that would make um, some of those projects more doable. And while we're in the emergency that I would have the authority to release those funds to the conditional group 
or um, or we could uh, uh, after the emergency bring it back to council. Okay, thank you. Can I ask my second question? Hello. Uh, so I want to go to the land transfer, which is um, uh, I believe page uh, two thirty three. After land transfer? Yeah. Uh, I'm just pulling it up here. So I, I just want to understand um, any um, sale or acquisition of land by the county, um, should that not come before council? Uh, before, like, I, I know. We've delegated authority, and I'm good with that. But when it comes to land, I'm having a bit of a problem. <laughs> I've since found some information out, and looking through that report, the information I found out, I don't see in that report. You're frozen, Councilor Nyman. I the opportunity to. I think to be uh, Councilor Nyman, you're going to have to ask your question again. You 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 froze. Can, I, oh, can you hear me now or no? Yeah, yeah. just if you yeah, could okay. state your question again. Okay. So the, the sale of land or acquisition of land should not come before council because looking through that report, I've received, I was able to get some information. And um, I don't see it in there. And, and by, and as I said, we've delegated authority and I'm okay with that. But when it comes to land owned by municipality, I'm having a hard time because without the conversation of council as a whole, we don't get all the information maybe. So I'm just wondering, and I know it's too late for this one, but in the future, if there's delegated authority, land deals should come before council, I would think. Oh, uh, through, through your worship, uh, to answer Councillor Nyman's question. Hey, so in uh, bylaw number 41-2020, which was the bylaw that was passed to delegate authority to the CAO, um, as it relates to matters under the Municipal Act. Uh, Clause A refers to the disposition and acquisition of any real or personal property of the municipality. So this was a broad power given. I have uh, chosen not to exercise it for any of uh, any significant uh, land sale deals, uh, but this one was a, um, a small, um, uh, sliver of property that uh, resolved uh, some outstanding legal matters and uh, I felt addressed. Um, we were spending a lot of money on consultants and lawyers to sort out uh, who owned a little piece of property that everybody seemed to think should have been part of the municipality a long time ago. So I saw this as an administrative correction. I think there are issues related to what is happening on that site, the adjacent um that are being dealt with through enforcement and, and are a bigger issue but the actual matter of who owns that sliver of land is what this land exchange refers to so i i felt while i know that the issue in the site may be more controversial there this particular piece of putting part of that site into the adjacent municipal park uh, and restoring a historical error seem to be a narrow administrative error. I, uh, I, I would say that, um, you know, I am struggling with the exercise of the delegated authority as we start to come back to a new normal. And I would encourage council to consider what of the, how long do we want to be in the municipal emergency and how do we want to deal with the delegation of authority? Because I believe these bylaws were written in a context where we did not uh, expect to come back to council meetings. And as we start to have more regular meetings and more regular committee meetings, I recommend council uh, think about what they want to do with the uh, bylaw uh, 41 2020 in particular. So, just a quick follow up, a quick comment. Let's say I'm okay with the delegated authority. It was just, I just wanted to kind of voice my concern about the 
the land deal. That's all. Okay. Well, I think it, I think the point is well made that we are we are you know getting into this is effectively what the new normal may look like for quite some time. So we've got to consider consider um, you know reviewing the delegated authority and you know the whole matter of, of the. Uh, the declaration of emergency, but that is that is something that we can we can bring forward in the near future. Any other questions? Like, Councillor Bolick, if you're uh, Madam CAO. So I just yeah. want to also um, uh, remind, as it relates to that um, report, that was a report that allowed a process to begin. So it doesn't actually exercise the change of ownership of the land, but it enabled um, legal steps to be taken. So it, uh, as many reports that come to council end up becoming uh, one or two or three parts uh, of decisions, this is the first part of the decision to enable the next steps. Okay. Councillor Bolick, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yes, okay. please, just a point of order. I'm not sure if anybody else is getting it. There's a lot of crosstalk coming through on my side, including music, and I'm not sure if that's coming from any of us or whether it's coming through the lines, but it's making it very difficult to hear. I'm not getting anything. Anybody else? Councilor Bailey? I hear you too. I've got it too. It sounds like some sort of interference, like some sort of electronic background hmm. maybe the chinese are listening to us maybe what <laughs> okay um all right any other questions concerning this item councillor maynard thank you on the um on the uh, the grants i just uh, when we come back to revisit uh, I would. I just want to make sure that the option is there to uh, to retain some of that money that we may then be able to use to offset some of our other um, expenses during this extraordinary time. We are likely for a lot of the grants that are uh, based on um, events or functions. Um, you know, we're we're likely to to lose the, the majority of the uh, of the year to it and uh, I, I just want to make sure that there is consideration given to the fact that we may not regrant that money that it may be repurposed for other uh, for other means or 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 simply left in the uh, to offset any other budget to uh, deficits that we may incur uh, to your worship in answer to the comment uh, from Councilor Maynard I just want to clarify that the report um, that I approved uh, what it does mm -hmm. is hold that money in general revenue for the county. Right. It does not decide where that money goes. And that's why I was suggesting right. to Councillor McNaughton, if there's an interest in revisiting all or part or more of that money through a second round, that would require a motion of council. Thank you. I, I agree. Um, anybody else? Okay, I'll call the vote. Madam Clerk. Councillor Harper. We're just receiving Marvin. <coughs> yes, we are. We're just receiving for information. Okay. Oh, just, a, just a hand, show of hands. So you show up, a show of hands should be sufficient. Not. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor. Okay, that carries. Uh, now it moves us to item 10.9, Councillor St. Jean. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a St. Jean Hirsch motion that Council receive report CAO 03-2020 for information. Okay. Questions? Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, this is, of course, the report that um, the CAO promised us, I guess, back in January. 
and we've been anxiously awaiting her good work. And I have to say, I'm I'm very impressed with the level of detail and the, the scope of the report. I'm sure, Marcia, this is not the report you thought you were going to start to write back in January. Uh, <laughs> circumstances have changed the subject matter rather significantly. But I think this is terrific. This is what we need to see every quarter. It really does uh, summarize and, and, and detail um, the operation of the county and of our government um, in a way that the public can understand, that the council can understand. We, we haven't had the ability to do this before. So congratulations for that. There is one question I have. Um, you've made a, a note in a couple of places that our cash flow problem, which is obvious because of uh, deferring of, of taxes and, and uh, penalties and, and uh, all of the loss of revenue from our facilities, but that cash flow problem can be at least partly looked after by construction loan. Mm -hmm. Do we have uh, any concept at the present time as to sort of how much money we're talking about? And um, what would sort of be, when, when would we anticipate this being paid back? Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, first of all, our cash flow situation is um, largely been uh, addressed. Uh, we're kind of dealing with it on a month by month basis as cash flow might indicate. And uh, by not hiring some positions or letting some contracts expire naturally, um, that saved some projected revenue. Uh, we've moved a lot of procurements that we're expecting to go um, for, for tender or for payment out in uh, June and July. We've pushed the work uh, where we could on some of these larger amounts to not have uh, it front load uh, so that we don't have bills coming in, in in the first part of the year. And we've been holding expenses uh, in all departments uh, to sort of essential things as much as possible. So um, uh, because we expect that people will start paying taxes again in September and we will have another chunk of revenue. So we're really trying to avoid the loss of revenue um, that taxes would have given us in June in the year that we had uh, planned for it. We were very fortunate that COVID happened after uh, the beginning of March because it meant we got some taxes or we would have been in a very different place. Municipalities that did not pass a budget at the time we did um, were quite stuck because they didn't have any tax levy uh, to draw on. So uh, the where we see pressure now in our budget is towards um, the month of August. And so most of that is coming from the large uh, construction uh, component of the roads work that council uh, has uh, approved to move forward and I think is quite popular in the county. So we are um, uh, there. It is easier to get basically like a bridge loan. It's done through the provincial government and you can get um, a loan to to carry for a, a matter of months. Um, it It's well uh, um, it's easier to get than, a, than some other loan because it's clear where we're going to pay for it. It's just trying to get to the, the taxes we know we'll be getting. Uh, I, I, I know that Amanda Carter, our, our finance director, is trying to get in on this Zoom call and is having some technical problems. But uh, So I, I don't know exactly the number, but we are probably in the three to four million, if I were to guess, based on um, some of the conversations around procurement. But yeah, if and when Amanda joins, she can uh, confirm that. But that's that's basically what we're trying to do and where we see the pressure. And with a construction loan, it's the it's the we'll get a favorable rate to basically bridge us uh, from the province. Uh, we'll put it out for um, banks to to bid on, but typically the province gives you the best for that kind of function. That's great. Thank you. The questions. Okay, seeing none, if we could, um, if we could have- I think each... Councillor Nyman's trying to jump in. Oh, Councillor Nyman? Didn't uh, see your hand. Yeah, well, I was a little late, so thanks to the Madam CAO for seeing it. I just have one question. The, the, the pumper tanker, so we're going ahead and, and purchasing that? Is that what I'm seeing on page 310? Because I remember when we were talking about it, I think in budget, um, there was some discussion on that. So, um, I just wanted to, I think Councillor Hirsch wanted to pull it at that time. 
So, uh, and I think it was mentioned that it would come before us again. So I just want to. CAO. Yeah. So I um, wish Amanda was on this line, but I, I, I do know that I have a uh, report uh, for the, uh, for a fire truck that I did not approve under delegated authority. I left it uh, to sit. So I'm not sure whether this is that truck or a different truck, but, um, but I do know that uh, there is a decision pending on a fire uh, truck coming to council um, likely later in June. Thank you. All right. Uh, so if we could have a show of hands about this item, please. All those in favor? Okay. And that carries. And that moves us to 10.10, Councillor McNaughton. Is it? Yep. 10.10. Oh, uh, so, and once again, my program that was giving me the names. Who's the seconder? Sorry. That's a Forrester. This is the McNaughton Forrester motion that the action items from the mayor's economic recovery team meeting be received for information. Okay. Questions? Okay. All those in favor? Hands up. Okay, and that carries. Moves us to 10.11. Councillor Bullock. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> this is a Bullock. You want me to read the whole thing, right? Yep. Uh, this is a Bullock Nyman motion um, or resolution, pardon me. And reading it out, it says, whereas in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the province of Ontario declared a state of emergency on March 17th, 2020, and a municipal state of emergency was declared by Prince Edward County Head of Council pursuant to Section 4 of the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, EMCPA, on March 26th, 2020, in support of the provincially declared state of emergency and in anticipation of possible springtime flooding. Whereas section four sub one of the EMCPA confers on the head of council the power to take such action and make such orders as he or she that considers necessary and are not contrary to law to implement the emergency plan of the municipality and to protect property and the health, safety and welfare of the inhabitants of the emergency area. Whereas past emergencies have been limited in time, space and scope, but that the COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented event that is international in scope and is likely to last for a considerable time. Whereas the Council of the Municipality of Prince Edward County recognizes that those extraordinary powers which are granted to the head of council in an emergency are intended to be exercised to allow for immediate action to be taken to prevent imminent loss of life, damage to property, or both. And whereas such grant of powers should be exercised sparingly as they are within the normal competency of municipal council, and thus the preferred process for determining all other matters is by way of decisions of council. Therefore, be it resolved that the council of Prince Edward County direct the chief administrative officer to have staff prepare a bylaw to guide and instruct the head of council as to when and how the emergency powers granted by the EMPCA should be exercised by the head of council, ensuring that efficient and effective communications with and advice from council and other bodies are established and maintained, and the recall of council at the earliest possible date to ensure continuity of representative government within Prince Edward County, and that the draft bylaw be brought before council at its meeting on June 23rd, 2020. And if I may speak to that. Go ahead. Thank you. All right, so obviously we've all just experienced an unprecedented and are continuing to experience an unprecedented event with, with this COVID pandemic, which, you know, the first wave looks like we, uh, it looks good. I'm not gonna try to <clears throat> jinx that by saying anything other than that, but we know that 
from all the reports that this is not a sprint, but it's likely to be a year to a year and a half worth of effort throughout Canada and in fact throughout the world to get through this pandemic. And um, the, EMCP, the EMCPA is pretty vague, perhaps intentionally so, um, and looking at our emergency plan, it's also somewhat vague in specifics. So I think it behooves us at this point, being two months into this, where we've all seen some of the issues and, and the struggles um, that our mayor has gone through, you know, and, and is still going through because it's, a, it's quite a burden. So I think this is, is an ideal time to, to bring forward a bylaw, to put some framework in there and give some structure so everybody knows what's expected and what can and should be done. So that's why uh, I'm bringing it forward at this time. And I, I've had some discussions with the CAO about timings. I understand that that timing uh, uh, is doable as far as a draft to come before us. And certainly, you know, in a year or two time, when uh, this pandemic is with, uh, with good luck going to be done, and we do our postmortem at that time, we can certainly adjust and uh, make any amendments. So that's, uh, that's the gist of it. And uh, I hope back to you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to make a few comments, if I may, before I um, um, open the floor to questions. The, um, you know, part of the implication in this resolution is, is that um, some decision making has been undertaken unsparingly, which um, is not the case. Uh, we are dealing with a situation that is unfolding at breakneck pace. Um, council has been and continues to be informed of um, steps that have been taken as we deal with this. Um, and it's, we're dealing with it uh, for the purpose of the protection of our residents' health and safety. Um, as noted, this is a global pa pandemic. I agree with Councillor Bolick that this is going to unfold over a long period of time. Um, news from around the world, um, given recent reopenings in, in other countries, has been promising and a day later is dashed by uh, some new statistic as to what, um, what has occurred. The resources of members of council, our municipal staff, members of the public have been engaged first and foremost to ensure that health and safety of our community. That in my mind, and I think everybody I'm looking at on this screen um, must remain our paramount and undistracted concern. I'm extremely encouraged um, by the low case count that we have in our municipality. And I think at least part of that is the result of this collective effort. The extent of COVID-19 uh, and its effect on our, our economy <clears throat> and our residents is um, still being played out. And as I say, will be played out for some time. Um, I, I uh, informed council in late April that upon moving out of the pandemic, we will be undertaking a thorough review of our processes and our procedures related to this emergency in preparation for the next one, if and when, if and when that occurs. And I am of the belief it is not an if, it is a when. Um, to divert the valuable resources of our staff members away from the immediate tasks at hand uh, to a matter that's best considered at a much later date is, in my mind, a disservice to our community. Um, we 
the efforts of uh, staff uh, in my mind should not be employed doing the research into a bylaw that can wait until we go through this review at um, a later date. Um, we have to we have to all row in the same direction. That means all members of council, staff, and me. And uh, I have stated from the outset, as uh, early as December 18th, that I am, um, I am not going to and won't make unilateral decisions. The council will be involved in decision-making because that ultimately is what we collectively have been elected to do. So at this point, I will, uh, if anybody else have any comments or questions, just if I could see a hand to address this. Councilor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I would like to say I'm quite impressed how we've handled ourselves through this so far. I think the lines of communication have been quite good. At no point have I felt left out of the loop and I've been able to get a hold of you. If I have questions and I've talked to several other councillors on daily or weekly basis. So it is a difficult time, but I do agree with you. And I think most governments, both local, municipal and federal governments will be looking to do full reviews on their emergency response once this is done, because I think we're learning new lessons that have never had to be dealt with before. So right now I'm okay with the way things are going. And when this is all said and done, when we can all put our minds and thoughts together, I think that would be the appropriate time to do it. Anybody else? Councilor Maynard. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Well, I, I don't read in here anywhere where there's any implication that, uh, that any decisions have been um, made that are not, uh, have not been transparent. I will say that um, earlier in this in this very meeting, you mentioned that it may be time to uh, to consider um, ending our declaration of emergency. And uh, now that council is meeting on a regular basis, so we have a full agenda tonight. And um, and in fact, some of our neighboring municipalities never did uh, declare a state of emergency. So I think that this is just looking for some, some guidance um, and some instructions that it doesn't have to be a huge uh, task for staff. Um, I think that we, um, there's nothing emergent in this, uh, in this situation anymore. This is our new normal. And I think that this council is, uh, is quite capable of, um, of performing our duties in support of our municipality exactly the way we are doing it this evening. So I, I support the, um, the intent of this, uh, of this resolution. I think that uh, review and guidance is always, uh, is always welcome, especially in these uh, uncertain and um, untested waters. And um, I'll go to the very last bullet in the last therefore, the recall of council at the earliest possible date to ensure continuity of representative government within PEC. Councillor Margotson. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, my take on what this resolution is trying to advance, and my own thoughts on the matter is, I would prefer us to look into whether we can remove the state of emergency, because the urgency that at the outset with the unknowns was there, but I feel we're moving into a, a, a state where we can meet and make decisions collectively. And although I, I feel and I agree with your worship that we can review our emergency preparedness and our emergency plan and, and the delegation of powers and communication, I think what's more important and what I've heard tonight in a, a few times is that we perhaps it's time to reflect on whether we continue with the state of emergency, which is the implications of the delegated authority and the communications we have with staff and other issues that have arose since the state of emergency. 
And this resolution, I guess for me, the spirit would be the spirit that I have is that we need to work together. I, I'm hoping we can learn or get, gain, gain insight from mistakes we may have made or things that we could do better perhaps as we go forward. I don't think there's any urgency to that right now. I'd like us to try and transition to a, a state where we're all working together and perhaps not in a state of emergency. So I feel that in the, also the June 23rd date, it, I, I don't think it, a bylaw to me is not necessary right now. So I feel just to recap what I'm saying is that we investigate removing the state of emergency in cooperation with the CAO to see how we're going to continue from going forward from this point on. Anybody else? Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I, um, I, I certainly support the spirit of what Councillor Bullock is asking for here. I think, um, and especially with the experience we've had with this rather lengthy um, and continuing emergency, um, it is definitely worth having a look at, at what are the emergency powers that we want to delegate at some, in some future occasion. So it's definitely worth pursuing this exercise, whether June the 23rd is the appropriate date to, to decree that that be done by, uh, to me is open to debate. If, if we're um, still occupying too much of staff's time coping with the current situation, then perhaps this should be put off some, but I would like to see the exercise proceed. Thank you. Councilor Harper. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I agree with what I'm hearing around the table as well. I, I think the spirit of it's great. I think we do want to do it. I just, I wouldn't want to see the staff burden. It's it's not that uh, June 23rd is not that that um, much of a time frame. And I would think uh, because it's so important, I don't know what level of research is needed, but certainly consulting other municipalities and um, other situations, maybe learning from other states of emergency might be helpful. So. I'd be quite fine if we push that date out. And, and I do agree with some of the others that, um, you know, recalling council at the earliest possible date, you know, uh, relaxing the emergency measures uh, makes, uh, makes sense now. I think we're into a new normal and it's, it's, uh, it's possible for us to get back to uh, our, our regular duty as we have had it in the past. Councilor St. Jean. Oh. Oh, okay, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I I, uh, I have to concur with a lot of the statements that, that were being made. I, uh, I I understand the 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 sentiment in the the resolution. Uh, I do have to remind everybody that item C has has been achieved. We are beginning to meet on a regular basis, uh, so I don't see the need of that. What I uh, I definitely would like us to see, figure out how we lift this state of emergency. Uh, things are getting better slowly. There are many, many challenges still ahead of us. Uh, so, so I'm a little reluctant to say, yes, stop it now. We definitely have to have that discussion. Uh, and along with that discussion, uh, uh, sorry, along with uh, a further discussion on what the next steps are and and how do we assist a our current mayor and and even maybe a future mayor in, in some guidance as is recommended in the resolution however i don't think now is the time to be demanding or, or requesting of our staff when to 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 go through all the effort of drafting a special bylaw and I will say that I've experienced this myself not too long ago with something so simple as a flag bylaw. To allow a flag to be flown in front of Shire Hall that is not a, a municipal, provincial, or federal flag. There's a lot of work that goes into any bylaw. This one is going to require a lot more. And to, to, do, uh, to create a bylaw now that's only going to get recreated in a few months, because I will reference back to the CAO's report uh, on page 302, 
Administration and Government Governance Process Review, which will be underway very, very shortly. And it states, the county will benefit from some third-party expertise to improve our policies, bylaws, and processes. I think that's where we're headed, and I think we need to do that, absolutely. But now is not the time. So, um, I would like, and I have a deferral motion that I would like to read. And I will, uh, I haven't got a set, an official seconder yet, but I would like to get it out there and in hopes that somebody will def uh, support it. Uh, and if you'll bear with me, that item 10.11 be deferred and further that action items A, B, and C contained within the resolution be included for consideration in the forthcoming administration and governance review, review of Prince Edward County bylaws and policies as was identified in the CAO report, item 10.9 of tonight's agenda. Okay, well, let's um, let's see if anybody else wants to weigh in on, on the, um, the the resolution that Councillor Bolick tabled. Uh, Madam CAO, did you have your hand up? I'm fighting with Catalina. Okay, um, I just wanted to uh, read um, an, an email from um, Councillor Roberts. Uh, he was unable to come, but uh, he felt very strongly about this item and he asked us to uh, read this into the uh, official record. It's not very long, I'll, I'll read it quickly. He, he, this is uh, Councillor Roberts. Unfortunately, I'm unable to Zoom with my co council colleagues this evening, but if I was in attendance, I'd be cautioning against passage of item 10, Point 11 and the resolution brought forward by Councillor Bullock. In brief, I agree with Andreas that a proper postmortem should be conducted once this emergency has ended. And that postmortem may well lead to further guidance regarding the role and parameters of our head of council for future emergencies. This is not the time, however, in my view. Yes, we must assess and consult with those impacted by our Shire Hall processes and decision-making during this pandemic. Adjustments will almost certainly be required. That said, we are still very much in this emergency. Witness the uptick in deaths and cases just today. This is not the time to detour our senior staff and council, focus away from fighting and mitigating this COVID-19 plague. Assigning valuable CAO staff resources to undertake research, legal consultation, consult with necessary stakeholders, and craft such a new bylaw now, when all of us are being pr proactive and responsive to quick paced events unfolding all around us, seems inappropriate to me at this juncture. And I can say with certainty, there is no constituent of mine who has asked for such a bylaw. The public I interact with think we're doing a pretty darn good job. So I question the need at this time, but agree that a proper postmortem should definitely be undertaken. Thanks for considering this viewpoint this evening. Okay. Councilor Nyman. Councilor Nyman. Oh, he's frozen. Okay, Councilor McNaughton, then Councilor Nyman. If Councillor Nyman unfreezes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I I actually think that it, it's good to do postmortems when everything is fresh. I think also that constituents that I've heard from are are very grateful for the efforts that have been made, and feel a certain degree of confidence that things have been done very well. I certainly I feel that way also. Um, but I do think the best time to, but uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that we can't lay out pathways for the future. And I think the best time to review and have postmortems is while things are as fresh as possible. I would never be married to June 23rd. I find that to be a little bit soon, but, um, but sooner rather than later. So I just wanted to weigh in with that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, is Councillor Nyman unfrozen? He's a little jerky. Yeah, yeah I can hear you, but you're not. I'm not. Okay, try, try now. Go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to ask uh, Madam CAO then. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of, I'm in agreement with it. Um, you know, I think it, you know, we need to look at how we can do things better. Not that we haven't done good things, but there's always room for improvement. Doesn't matter what you do. Um, and 
So the question would be, um, from what I'm hearing here is the date seems to be um, an issue. Um, so I, I know you talked to Councilor Bullock about it and kind of agreed that could, timing could work. Do you think you need more time? Because the next emergency could be, you know, next week or next month or even tomorrow. So I'm just wondering, is that time good or would you like an extent, a little bit longer time? Madam CAO. Okay, uh, to your worship, um, I, I did have this conversation as Councillor Bullock uh, described. I mean, I think the, the idea uh, was to find a time that was as soon as possible without making it entirely open-ended. Um, another alternative, uh, which doesn't give the same certainty is to tie it to whenever the municipal emergency is lifted. But it sounds like if uh, at least some councillors are thinking this is partly how you get to lift the emergency. I, I will say that um, regardless of the date in this motion, um, the emergency control group has been in conversation around how do we extract ourselves uh, from this municipal um, emergency and how do we tie that to a bunch of decisions that have yet to be made so we, we at the provincial level. So we may feel that things are uh, on the right trend, but we're still in a place where you can't gather more than five people. So uh, we don't know when that's gonna change, but that will have a big impact on how we can uh, view exiting this municipal emergency. So I, I don't have a better date. Uh, I, I think that um, other than tying it to the end of the emergency, some matter of weeks after the emergency so that, um, uh, to Councillor McNaughton's point, the uh, the postmortem post happens quickly after we exit emergency. But other than that, I I can't predict either when this when we're going to get to a place. I would prefer to do this after we have um, exited the emergency. But I just and and I'm anticipating that by the end of June, I'm feeling uh, more optimistic, but uh, then, then if you picked something early June or end of May, let's say, but it is just a guess. Okay. Anybody else? Councilor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, well I do agree with uh, CAO there. You know, whenever you look at an incident of this nature, you know, at the very end, once you've got through it, you want to look at what failed, what didn't fail, what we did wrong, what we did good, what were our best practices, what did we totally screw up and thought, well, we should have seen this coming. So when this is all said and done, and when we get back to somewhat normal, I think there's a lot of analyzing that we have to do looking at this whole situation and how we rolled it out. And, and I think we have reacted fairly well. But from then, once you have you've got all the information in and on what you did good what you didn't do good then you can make some good decisions on setting up a path for the future so that's just my opinion right there okay. councillor saint jean and then we'll move this forward okay thank, thank you and uh once again uh councillor forrester has segued into some of my statements uh, and again uh, I, I go back to the, the CAO's report and she's saying that the latter half of 2020, well, the latter half of 2020 is coming up pretty fast. We are in May, June is right around the corner. And uh, what better time to have that review and look at uh, the processes, as Councillor Forster said, where, uh, what we did good, what we did bad. Um, we're not ready to pull out of the emergency order. So uh, I think it's rushed if we think we can get something like this done in June. Uh, I, I feel that it's important that we wait for the, the uh, uh, administration and governance process review. I think that's the ideal place for it. Uh, we're going to be spending $35,000 to have that uh, review done. Uh, I don't want to see us duplicating a process and again, wasting, in my mind, wasting staff's time when they have so many more important things to do right now, and that is dealing with an, an existing ongoing emergency. So therefore, I've got, I have my motion out there for you. 
for all of you to consider. Uh, I just need a seconder so that we can actually get on with a, a decision, one way or the other. Okay, we've got got a I couple. Of Councillor Forrester. I didn't hear you, Councillor Forrester. Yes, yeah, so I'll second that for Councillor St. Jean. Okay. We've got Councillor Maynard had her, had her hand up and then we'll... Yes, so I, I question whether this was really what we would have ever envisioned in an administrative and, and governance review. I mean, it could be part of that, but I see no reason why we can at least have a, a cursory review of what's going on right now. Um, staff is telling us that you know sometime in the mid to latter part of june would be would be doable i don't see this as being a, a and i guess like is this to staff is this a, a project that would be really that to uh, that particularly onerous considering that there really is only three particular bullet points that are uh, requested in this as opposed to having a full governance review and then i will have a quick follow-up uh, so, on, on the governance, sorry, uh, Your Worship. Uh, on, thank you. On the, your governance um, review, the RFP is out for tender. It's supposed to close yeah, the end of May. Um, mm -hmm. So, it wasn't part of what was initially uh, scoped, but it was intended to give us new, um, uh, fresh perspective on our municipal comparators, municipalities of similar size and, and structure that we could learn from in terms of uh, what their policies are. And we certainly could make uh, emergency management one of the areas we asked them to focus on. It wasn't part of the plan, but it, it could be because we're at the right stage for that. In terms of when is the right time, um, staff are here to serve council. So we will make whatever time council's decision requires. And if, and if I can, yeah, quick follow up. Um, I think what we really have to take out of this, whether, you know, this is not a, uh, this, not, this is not a criticism. This is an introspection. But at the end of the day, we need to be functioning as council wholly. And until we, so maybe the better question is, how do we extract ourselves in the uh, near future from this, uh, from our uh, declared state of emergency? Because we can still meet electronically. We can continue our business as we, as we have shown that we're doing tonight and uh, have uh, full participation of council in all decision making. There are, I think that Madam CAO can probably provide some clarity about the electronic meetings and how those were tied to what, um, what occurred with the province. Yeah, so your worship is correct. The, uh, the ability for us to meet and vote, for council to vote electronically, um, we passed a bylaw that council passed a bylaw that allowed for electronic participation, but it was positioned as a temporary bylaw. You could ask for that bylaw to come back as a permanent bylaw to allow um, a, a electronic participation, and we would incorporate it into our procedural bylaw, but that is not how it was drafted. So it's an administrative thing, not a big hurdle. The bigger problem is that the provincial um, orders requires either the province or the municipality to be in emergency. And we're not confident that we can actually predict what the province is going to do. So we could be in a situation where the province announces in a week or two weeks, you know, right now their current deadline is June 2nd. They typically have been giving us 12 to 24 days notice that, uh, that they're extending it. But if they don't extend it, they may not give much notice. And then all of a sudden we would not be in a provincial emergency and we would have to, um, we would have to disband this method in order to have voting. So we go back to some kind of uh, socially distant um, arena model, like our very first council mm -hmm. meeting. Yeah, in our, person. Yeah, because we can't do social distancing in our current council with all of you there. So, mm -hmm. um, so there is some um, technicalities around um, exiting the um, order that we'd have to figure out how to manage in terms of logistics. Councillor Nyman. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do you need a motion to extend? We're past the three hours. Uh, yeah, we do actually. I'll make that motion. Okay, who's seconding? Councillor McNaughton, all those in favor? Okay, thank you. Um, who had a hand up? 
somebody. No? Councillor Margotson. Yes, I just wanted to um, say again that I, I, I feel we need to um, sort out how we're going to deal with this, what I call the long emergency. Um, and I think we'll be getting more guidance from the province as far as being able to gather in, in larger, uh, larger numbers or whatever in the next few weeks. And so that to me is more important than a, than a, than a bylaw right now or what people are calling, you know, a post-mortem or whatever. So I think I've heard that. I heard it just from uh, Councillor Maynard, I believe, that that's what we're dealing with here. And so if we can structure that through the CAO to, to make adjustments as necessary, and I, I know we're dealing with what a state of emergency allows us to do and what it doesn't allow us to do if it's lifted. But anyway, that's my feelings on it. Okay. Anybody else before we uh, move on? Okay, Councillor Bullock. Yeah, just uh, just to reiterate, this was not supposed to be an indictment of it, of anything or any specific person. It's there to provide guideposts and a map to assist people uh, in in times where um, you know everything's up in the air. So that's that's the intent here. Yeah, the. Uh... <laughs> The unfortunate position we and every other municipality globally is in is being very much up in the air. Um, last week for, I think all of us, I'll speak for me, was a real eye opener when um, certain portions of our economy were given two days notice that they were gonna be able to open followed by uh, another announcement on Saturday that the parks were going to be partially reopened. So the, uh, the predictability of the province in, in terms of where they will go, what, what they will lift, when they will lift it, is um, one of the challenges uh, we have. But anyway, Councillor St. Jean, you wanted, you want to, you, you've got a, a, a deferral motion? You want to yes, and it was duly duly seconded. I was going to call a point of order because the discussion was certainly nowhere around the topic of a deferral. So uh, please call the motion, sir. Sorry. I'd okay. like a recorded motion, a recorded vote on that too. Record. So, through Sorry. your worship, if I may. Madam Clerk. So just for a point of clarification, if you are deferring the whole motion, that means the whole motion is going to come back to a future council meeting at an applicable time. Councilor Jean, if you could just expand. So is your intent just for items A, B, and C contained within the resolution to be included as part of the governance and administrative review? Or do you want the whole motion to be deferred and come back at a future meeting? Uh, as my motion was worded, that is my intent that it A, B, and C. So, yes. <laughs> sorry, so, so I'm just gonna read what I have based on your, your email. So that item 10.11 be deferred and that action, action items A, B, and C contained within the resolution seeking council support for a bylaw to guide and instruct the head of council regarding emergency powers granted by the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act be included for consideration in the forthcoming administration and governance review of Prince Edward County bylaws and policies as was identified in the CAO report, item 10.9 of tonight's agenda. Yes. Okay. So if we're deferring it, then it's the whole motion will be included. Exactly. Not just that, eight That's the way I worded it, and that is the way I wish it to be deferred. So, please uh, clerk, we're voting on the um, Councilor St. Jean is request a recorded vote. May I? We need some yes. clarification. Clarification on. Clarification. So, are we? Uh, we're in. 
the intent of the motion then will be to defer this until we have sometime much later have a admin the administrative and governance review that we won't uh, delve into any of this until that's complete probably what fall maybe that's the that's it, what this is intending to do i think that's councillor st jean's intention is it not um, yes, it is. So it's, the, it's, uh, the, it's the long deferral. Okay, thank you. Not that long. Not that long. Be through your worship, if I may, I'll call the vote. Thank you. Councillor St. In okay. favor. No. Councillor Bailey. In favor of. Councillor Bolick. Opposed to? Councillor Forrester. In favor of? Councillor Harper. In favor of? Councillor Hirsch. Well, he's muted. I thought I unmuted all. Opposed to? Councillor McNaughton. Opposed to? Councillor Margotson. Opposed to. Councillor Maynard. Opposed to. Councillor McMahon. Opposed to. Councillor Nyman. Opposed to. Councillor Prinzen. Opposed to. Mayor Ferguson. Favor. And that loses eight to five. So that, that loses, loses back to the, um, the original. Um, okay, where are we going with this now, Madam Clerk? So it has been duly, Nyman has a question. Sorry, uh, Council Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to just make an amendment if I could, uh, uh, maybe, I don't know if it's a friendly amendment or not, but uh, as a friendly amendment, as long as Councilor Bullock's okay with it, is to move the date from the 23rd of June. I'm not sure because we changed all the meetings. Is, do we have a meeting in July? We're going to go back into a regular, uh, regular rotation yeah. of Council meetings and committee the whole meetings. I know, but we changed the meeting earlier this year where we used to have oh. the meetings, but we don't have that now. So I'm just wondering, do we have meetings in July? Yeah. Yep. Yes, uh, we do. Go ahead, Madam Clerk. Uh, yes, we do. We have two meetings in July. The seventh, Brad. What's, what's, what's the last meeting? July 21st. Okay, I'd like to too late. move the date. To July 21st because come the fall second wave from everything I'm hearing the second wave will be here and in the fall you could be right back to where we are now so that's why July 1st of August so July 21st would be the date that I was for if Councillor Bullock is okay with it I have no problem with that Madam CAO, what do you think? Um, I, I I told Councillor Bullock that I would deliver on June 23rd, so I June July 21st is also possible. Okay. All right, so we um, we need to vote on this, Madam Clerk. Mm -hmm. Yes, Your Worship. Okay. So are we doing the show of hands? Or are we doing a- oh, No, we should do the- No, vote. we will do a recorded vote. Recorded vote. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Bullock. In favor of? Councillor Forrester. Opposed to? Councillor Harper. For a... What was that? I... Sorry, what was that, Councillor Harper? In favor of 
Councillor Hirsch. In favor of. Councillor McNaughton. In favor of. Councillor Margetson. In favor of. Councillor Maynard. In favor of. Councillor McMahon. In favor of. Councillor Nyman. In favor of. Councillor Princeton. In favor of. Councillor St. Jean. Opposed to. Councillor Bailey. Opposed to. Mayor Ferguson. Opposed. That carries nine to four. This is two uh, committee. Committee reports item 11.1, .1, Councilor Nyman. Uh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Mayor. It's a Nyman, excuse me, Nyman Maynard motion that the public report of the closed session for the electronic council meeting held on April 15, 2020, be adopted as presented. Okay, thank you. Any questions? No, all those in favor? Just show of hands, please. Thank you. That carries. Bylaws for consideration, Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a Hirsch Forrester motion that the following bylaws be read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. 11.1.1, 11.1.2, 11.1.3 and 11.1.4. Okay, all, of, all those in favor? And that carries. We have no closed session. We have no motions arising from the closed session. Councillor McMahon, your item 15.1. Thank you, Your Worship. This is uh, McMahon Margaretson motion that the following bylaw be read a first, second, and third time and finally pass the bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the County of Prince Edward at the meeting held on May the 12th, 2020. Thank you, all those in favor? And that carries and item 16.1, Councillor uh, Bolick. This is a Bolick Maynard motion to adjourn the, this council meeting at 10.30 p.m. All those in favor? And that carries. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody, for your participation. Take care. Ciao, ciao.